Hey Spock, how you doing? I think she wants to be on camera too. So I wore this shirt just for y'all. <laughs> this was a gift from Coral Works. See, that's their brand. And I like the back of it. I kind of wish it was on the front because it's so me. So yes, I am sorry that I am late. And I wanted to start off with a question to you guys. So I'm gonna actually look at your comments right this minute. And I want to know how you guys are holding up. So share with me how this week has gone for you in your comments. I want to kind of hear from you guys. I've been dealing with my own thoughts in my own head. I've been worried about the future of mankind. And, you know, I'm not trying to be a panic monger because, you know, I'm not. But I do worry that, uh, you know, some people are not taking it seriously enough. And I am, you know, that puts us all at risk. So tell me what's going on with you. <laughs> uh, today, while I'm waiting for your comments, uh, our weather is kind of cruddy. We're supposed to have rain for the next couple of days. Uh, my truck needs to be washed, but uh, I'm not gonna, why, why bother when it's raining down on it? But I, uh, other than that, you know, it's been business as usual. I've been working daily. I actually need a day or two off really badly, but I don't see that happening anytime soon. But I could really use some downtime to just recharge. So, um, today, and I know I always say it, but I actually mean it, today's stream will not go long because I do have things I must accomplish, including I want to release a video today. I, I actually loaded it into Final Cut Pro last night, and then today I walked up to the computer as my phone rang and I was stuck on a one-hour phone call. So it's happening this evening. I want to release my little video. And in this video, I'm going to show the new Reef Bright light kit. I know it's not the favorite video you want. I'm just doing what's in my, my what's loaded. But it's going to be a two-part, so the first part is about the light kit, and the second part will be some close-ups of the reef tank that you never see in the live stream. So you can see the colors and the prettiness, and I just had someone recently uh, say, you know, I think it's nice you're offering your information, but your tank looks like crap. <laughs> I was like, don't watch the live stream tank, that's never going to be a good view. You want a good view, you need to watch one of my edited videos, which puts it back on me about releasing edited videos far more frequently than I have been. So, all right, now. Now that I've chattered enough, I want to see some of your comments. And I see that Vivid Creative Aquatics is here already. That's a shock. He usually misses it. Uh, let's see. <laughs> yeah, someone said, perfect shirt. Let's see. Uh, one person said, the people at the grocery stores is still crazy. Um... Uh, one person said, you know, things are rough, but I don't want to complain. Both my wife and, my, and myself are working from home. Some of us are able to work from home. Some of us have to go to work, yeah. So Mina says, you know, I'm scared every minute because they have to actually go to work and be around people that are sick or potentially sick. <laughs> Someone mentioned a shiny spot on the back of my head. That's got to be a reflection of the lights. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, one person says it's a big conspiracy. I don't think it's a conspiracy at all. I know that we have been lied to about what really happened, what got this started. There is no way that someone eating a bat caused this problem globally because people have been eating bats for a while over there. <laughs> what is so special about this bat? It's BS. Sorry, guys. I, I'm not going to go on a whole tangent about that, but... I definitely believe this was cooked in a lab and released into society accidentally, probably. And uh, they did everything they could to button it down, but shoo, viral, literally viral, it went out. Uh, one person said they're spending more money on reefing. I believe that. Uh, one person says I'm trying to control what I can control. I'm trying not to worry too much, but I'm uncomfortable. See, I'm just exhausted from worrying. And uh, I'm not used to that. That's not my, my M.O. I tend to just go through life happy. I'm very Disney-like in, in that regard. Everything's great. Everything's beautiful. I surround myself with good things. But, uh, no, the world is really, really, really uncomfortable right now. 
Um, let's see. Oh, a couple of things I need to tell you. So tomorrow I'm doing another live stream with the Niagara Coral Group. So that'll be happening. I think that is a, well, I'm not even sure. It could be YouTube or Facebook. So I'll try to post a link on my Mila's Reef page for you guys to find it in case you're not following that, that group. That was the coral show I was going to go to last month and then Corona happened and all the trips were canceled everywhere. And then next Wednesday, I'm doing a live stream with Reef Dudes. So you've got a couple more coming up this week. So if you feel like this one's too short, that's okay. There's more to come. Let's see. Um, uh, Mr. Reef Buster says, I've been working on a few small projects on my nano tank, which is good. Uh, shooting videos for my channel, waiting on supplies to come in the mail so I can finish my videos. Uh, I'm working on adding a dosing pump and an ATO. Let's see. Oh, um, I asked you guys, or I, I shared with you guys an incredible tank uh, that is in Arizona right now that's all non-photosynthetic corals. So NPS is what the initials are. And I shared that on the Milo's Reef page. So facebook.com slash Milo's Reef, this one right here. Go to that link. Let me put that right in the middle of my chest so you can see it. I want you to go there and find that video. <clears throat> it's about nine minutes long. You don't have to watch it this minute. But watch that video because... The video uh, shows this beautiful tank with tunicates, gorgonians, uh, dendrophilia, and, and a bunch of little tiny fish, and it's absolutely stunning. I actually reached out to him and said, hey, have you talked to Coral Magazine about your tank? Because they should be featuring you. And uh, then I talked to Coral Magazine and said, have you seen this tank? Because you need to be featuring it. And uh, so there is a, a good possibility it'll go into publication. Also, uh, later this year, I'm scheduled to go to Macna if that still happens, which I, I don't know. I kind of feel like this whole year is a wash. But if it's possible that Macna is still taking place in August, then I might just drive to this guy's tank and film it. It's really, really pretty. And the, the filtration's not complicated. The feeding is the most expensive part of keeping that tank alive. And he feeds it four times a day, and he's having to use really high-quality filter feeder foods to keep it uh, stunning. So uh, check it out when you have time. Super good uh, tank that uh, the guy first, the guy's first name is Lam, L-A-M. And like I said, the video is on that link right there at facebook.com slash Milos Reef. So I want you guys to enjoy that. I mean, what else you got going on at home? You're watching Netflix. Take a break. <laughs> um, a lot of you are working from home. And yes, the Umbrella Corporation did release the virus. That's absolutely true. Ah, this person works at the fire station. Um, I just saw a really nice story on my... It came up through uh, my notifications on my phone that a woman went to see her mother for the last time. She was already in hospice, and I guess she was about to die. And she was able to fly there, and she was super worried about getting the virus, and when she got to the airport, she realized she had nothing to worry about because nobody's there. There's less people in the airport than there is in the supermarket. And then she flew there, got to spend, you know, I don't know, X amount of time with her mother. It was a day trip. She didn't want to stay there too long and risk getting infected. And she said that the, um, that the return trip coming home, there was no one on the plane. No one. She was the only passenger. And so they moved her to first class. And then, you know how they do the safety briefing? They did the safety briefing to her by name. And then when they got to 10,000 feet, the captain came on and said her name and said, we are at 10,000 feet. <laughs> and it was really, really sweet, you know, that they, I mean, she had to get home, but one person on a plane? Crazy, right? And it was a really nice story. Let's see. <laughs> one person said, the LFS are closed, the local fish stores, so it's saving me a lot of cash. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but I stashed some cash before this thing happened because you just never know if you need some green bills in your pocket. Wow. Uh, this person says they're working 10 to 12 hours a day, 7 days a week. Ugh. That kind of feels like my life. Let's see. Um, and other countries are really struggling with this thing and... I watched one little video where people in, I think it was, I think this was, I think this was India. 
and people are still congregating because people there do that. That's what they do. And they've been told, everyone stay in your homes. And there's guys out there with sticks just swatting people on the leg if they are in a group to chase them away. And if they're riding their bicycles or their mopeds and they're trying to go somewhere, they hit them with a stick to make them turn around and go back home. And then another country threatened to shoot on sight anyone found outside their home. Fortunately, that's not happening here in the U.S., but wow. Um... Yes, that, that's, that's the lighting, Ed. Stop looking. <laughs> uh, let's see. And yeah, I agree with Yvonne. She says, let's give a big thank you to all our first responders and medical professionals who put their own lives on the line to save others every single day. I saw one, video, uh, one article today about the nurses that have to wear those masks on their face so tight and they have creases. They are, uh, their ears are hurting from the straps being on there all day long for the entire 12 or 15 hours. And uh, I saw the coolest idea. I don't know if it was an Etsy idea or something, but one of my friends is a nurse in Alaska. And someone came up with the idea, you know the headbands that women always wear to hold their hair back? They sewed a button on each side above the ear of the headband. So they put the headband on, there's two giant buttons. And then when they put the mask on, they could put the rubber over the button instead of over their ear. So their ears get a break. I was like, that's brilliant. And it's such an easy fix. So hopefully we're going to continue to see more and more ingenuity uh, as we all try to come together and help each other through this uh, pandemic. <laughs> One person says, oh my God, the stream from the beginning, I feel faint. That's hilarious. <laughs> it's not like it's a secret when I start. I start after two every Saturday. You guys just need to set your clocks. <laughs> All right, so um, let's see what else we got here, and then I'm gonna get into the topic. It, and the reason I was late is because I could not pull the pictures out of my presentation, so I did a bunch of screenshots. <laughs> but that way I have something to show you guys. <clears throat> Um, Raul says that he is finishing up his calcium reactor project, plus a saltwater mixing station, automatic water changes. Wow, you're really automating? Right now you're home. You can do these things by hand. No, I'm kidding. Um, and uh, he's following one of the articles or one of the blogs on my website about how to set up the calcium reactor with a trident. And then someone asked me a question up here, and I scrolled past because I wasn't answering questions directly. I was asking for information. <laughs> I can't find it. There it is. What's the best way for carbon dosing is what Carrie Reefer asked. And uh, it depends what you're dosing. I mean, there are different products on the market. There's Nopox, which is a carbon dose. There is vodka, which is carbon dosing. Sugar, that's carbon dosing. Vinegar, that's carbon dosing. You're going to need to find the recipe on the web and the actual dosing routine. It's not just some blanket thing that works for everyone. But no matter what product you choose to use from whatever company, you want to follow the directions carefully and you want to go very gradually. You want to take your time. Do not rush because it's gonna, it needs to get established. What you're doing with carbon dosing is you're increasing the bacteria population within your tank higher than it normally would be with the carbon. And so that, let's just pretend the tank has a, a million bacteria. And when you carbon dose, you have 1.1 million bacteria, and you carbon dose a little bit more, and you're up to 1.1 million, 100,000, and you keep bringing it up slightly, a little bit more, and a little bit more, and then at some point, your tank might be 1.3 million bacteria. It's the perfect number, and you see your nitrates start dropping. That's the premise behind carbon dosing. We're adding the extra uh, fuel to increase more bacteria you normally have so they'll consume the nitrate within the water. All right. Hope that helped. Let's see. <laughs> uh, Odile apparently sent a super chat. It didn't show up on my screen, but uh, he said, pear-shaped, exaggeratedly stretching arm forward to a cup of coffee. Mmm, good idea. Oh, one person in Club Milo's Reef said how right now one of their his return pump had failed he didn't have a backup so guys if you don't have a backup of a very important key equipment for your tank i'd order it now especially since amazon is slow in delivering or go to your fish store and buy it in person 
you know, support your local store. You can even set up in advance, call the store, make sure they have it, and have them bring it to you at the curb rather than you walking into the store to limit contact time with other people. So please do have an extra heater, an extra return pump, an air pump with an air stone for an emergency, a generator of some kind, even a Harbor Freight generator will help your tank for a few hours when, you know, if the power goes out. Last night, the power coming to my house was dirty. My internet was spotty all yesterday and my power was flickering and my uh, I have a battery backup under the apex and it was kind of chattering and it wouldn't stop but the tank kept running and then finally I was getting notifications, your apex has lost power and I'm like, the whole tank has power. That's not true. <coughs> and so it ended up being that, you know, it was like a, I guess a brownout or something was happening. And even now I'm noticing, I mean, we're having rain right now and my lights kind of flickered for a second. So it's still, whatever's going on, you know, it could happen in your area too. You, your area might always be fine until it's not. So have some uh, extra prep gear ready on hand. And if you don't have it, buy it now. Alexa's talking behind me. She's always listening. I never talk to her. So I think she gets really lonely. Let's see. <clears throat> <laughs> Marcus says, I just got home from the LFS. I had to go. While I was there, a pearlberry kept winking at me and I had to bring it home. What was I supposed to do? You did the perfect thing. You literally did. I mean, we all understand it. We get it. We're all coral holics like you. Um, Steve says, my local fish store is closed and I'm out of salt. How long do you think I could go without a water change? Oh, a year or two? <laughs> You're asking the wrong guy. I am the king of what is a water change? I know a lot of people rely on them, and I understand why they do, and I get it. And if you can't get salt from your fish store, maybe you can buy it online. There's Premium Aquatics, there's BRS, there's Saltwater Aquarium, there is uh, Marine Depot. <laughs> I mean, you know, these are big companies. They've been around a long time. They ship salt, and you can get it delivered to your door. Can your tank get by for a week or two without a water change? Yes. I normally recommend water changes as 25% once a month. And a lot of people are doing it more frequently than that. And some of them are doing it, and you may be one of them, choosing to do the water changes because you're trying to maintain your parameters, such as alkaline and calcium and magnesium, because you don't want to dose. And so every time you do a water change, you're kind of bringing those numbers up slightly. And that might be a routine. But if you are two-part dosing, or three part, then you can actually go further between these water changes and you can be okay. But definitely get some salt as soon as you can because you might need to do a big water change all of a sudden and if you don't have the stuff you need, you can't do what you, you know, what the tank needs. Um, oh, nice. Nick says that he just got a notification through Reef Trace app that I was streaming. It's true, I am. And let me mention, uh, Reef Trace just had a new version drop. It, I think it released like two days ago. And I heard that there's an Android update that's going to go out on Monday. It's not the big uh, update, but there's some kind of patches. There's a few people in the Android world that are having, uh, I don't know, some kind of bugs or crashes or something. And uh, so they are looking into that to solve those problems. But they, the Android version will catch up with the iOS. It's just so many more people have the app or on Apple. So that's why all the attention goes to that one. And this is similar to the complaints that people have over in, you know, in, uh, in Europe that the Apex doesn't have the same power bar that the Americans have. And they say, you're ignoring us, you're not treating us fairly, there's so many of us. And it's just a matter of logistics, you know, what, where's the bigger audience, who are you going to tackle first? It's great to bring everyone under the umbrella, but if you have 10 iPhones to one Android, who are you going to focus on more? You're going to focus on the Apple community. So that's not a diss. I'm not trying to put down Android. And I know you guys will always find a link saying, look, 50% of owners have Android. Yes, but do 50% of Android owners have a reef tank? That's where the numbers change completely into completely different percentages. So let's keep that in mind. Uh, yeah, so if you haven't got the app yet, I use it for logging all my data. I love it for the local fish store locator. Which I realize, you know, there's a lot of things we talk about now that we can't do because we're not traveling. I, I saw someone post uh, on Facebook saying, is my gas tank on my car supposed to last three weeks? Because <laughs> none of us are driving. Or another one said, irony, the price of gas is at an all-time low and my tank is never low. It's you know, because we don't drive. So our, our vehicles are constantly full and you see the price of gas has just dropped to 
dollar fifty, a dollar. One place, I think it was in Ohio, was sixty-eight cents a gallon. Don't you just want to stockpile it for the summer and just have barrels in your backyard? Don't do that. But uh, yeah, it's like oh, it's such a bargain. Why? And then you start thinking, well, why is it so high all the time, and why is it so cheap right now? Gas prices have always bugged the crap out of me. <laughs> I just always feel like it's unfair. It, okay, you know, I'm gonna rant. Uh, there was a uh, a gas pump, a ga uh, the situation a few years ago where gas was like $4 a gallon. And we're all like, oh my God, I can't afford this gas. It's costing like $80 to fill up my car. And then, you know, ExxonMobil came out with a quarterly report and said, we made $4 billion last quarter. I'm like, well, yeah, of course you made it. You stole it from us. I don't think they should tell us how much profit they made when they're ripping us off so hard. I mean, it just... Uh... They could have just made one billion and been happy, and we could have kept paying two dollars a gallon. <laughs> Why do we have to suffer? Oh, all right. Uh, Brian says my lunar rats has been hiding under my aquascape for over a month now. Any reason as to why or what makes them do that? Sometimes the rats you got came from some other part of the world. They're on a totally different schedule, and they may be coming out later in the day or even at night, and then going back in because their internal clock says it's daytime, and they're wondering why is it so dark in here. So it could be that. Um, it could be some other fish is uh, really aggressively pursuing it, and so it's ducking for cover. Those are a couple ideas. But I've had that happen to me where I had a wrasse, and it just wouldn't come out till like, I don't know, 5 in the afternoon. I was like, that's so weird. And then eventually it learned my lights came on a little bit earlier in the day, and it started coming out right at 1 o'clock. Maybe that's it. Um, all right, all right. We're going to get into our topic here in a moment. Just catching up on the last year comments here. <laughs> One person said, uh, emergency doctor here, I wear the mask uh, and visors for 12 hours at a time, so you kind of get used to the scars and wear it like a like war paint. I believe it. You know, when I, when I go scuba diving and I wear my mask, if I let it suck to my face too tightly, I have this huge circle, and I'm... I can't see myself, but I'm super self-conscious knowing I've got this dent in my forehead and everyone's looking at me. <laughs> and you know, you give it 20, 30 minutes and it, it fades away, but I always feel like, like I look so dumb. And, uh, but yeah, the, the fact that these masks are so tight on your face and pressing in or even causing scabbing and bleeding on the bridge of the nose, I mean, wow. It was actually pretty uh, shocking to see those pictures. Let's see. Um, all right, you know what? I'm going to stop here. Thank you very much for all your answers. I really wanted to know how you guys are doing. Because uh, now I'm seeing just the regular reef questions come in. So we're, we're moving on, I can see. Uh, so I wanted to talk today about Montipore eating nudibranchs. And so I know someone later on is going to watch this video and they're going to put the video starts at 2315, you're welcome. <laughs> they love doing that. <laughs> it's like, okay, I get it. You know, I just wanted to kind of be personal and include you and not just ignore everything you say for the first 30 minutes like I do every single week. The uh, Montipora eating nudibranch is a nudibranch that literally only eats Montipora. That's why it has this weird name. And a lot of times it's being, you know, abbreviated to men, M-E-N, Montipora eating nudibranch. And the risk of getting them in your tank is just by not dipping your corals. So you are not going to buy live rock or rock from another guy's aquarium and just automatically get Montipore eating nudibranchs. But it's possible, you know, especially if like that hobbyist had Monty's and they weren't doing well. But then that should be on you that you didn't look at it closely enough uh, because we always are trying to be alert to what could happen. <clears throat> so I want to show you guys a picture. Um, where did I put it? Everything's hiding under my screen here now because I got so much on my screen. Well, let me first of all, let me tell you this. If you go to my website to the Critter ID section and then click on Pests, you will see this screen right here. And it will... It's the Montipora eating nudibranchs, and then it shows some close-ups of them on a Montipora and what kind of damage they're doing. So these are actually some phenomenal pictures because these are little tiny bugs. So when you go to Critter ID on the website, you would just go to pests, and then you would just find the correct pest right here. So that's the one I was just showing you right now. 
So that way you know where to find it later. <laughs> You're like, where was that? It was right there. Okay, so I just wanted to show you that. Now we are gonna, let me grab my folder I had here. And I wanna show you guys this picture. Let's see if this works. Hey, it works, all right, good. So right here is a Monopora in a frag rack at a frag swap for sale. And right in the very bottom, I could see the Monopora eating nudibranch that was being included with the coral. <laughs> so here you are shopping for coral and they give you the pests that will eat the coral. And they weren't doing it on purpose, I know that. But it just seemed like it was ironic. You buy the coral, it comes with the pest that eats the coral, you put it in your tank, it eats the coral, you have to go buy another coral. And it just seems to self-perpetuate. So you wanna be very careful. When you get your new coral, you definitely want to dip it to make sure there's no pests. And you wanna inspect the coral, you wanna flip it over, you wanna blow it off with a turkey baster with the dip solution on there, and that way you can make sure that you are not uh, introducing this pest into your tank. So that was the first one I wanted to show with you. Uh, and see, that's the thing. A lot of times we are so excited about the new thing, and there are so many dips on the market. Not everything is gonna always work, but the one that seems to be the most popular choice is the bear insecticide stuff from Home Depot or Lowe's, where it apparently kills anything that breathes. <laughs> so you could use that, uh, but you could use anything. You could use the stuff I like from Fauna Marin. You could use uh, Revive from Two Little Fishies. You could use Coral RX, which I think is the brand. I think that's the parent company too, Coral RX. And these are all ones that work, but you still need to take the coral, you need to turn it in your hand and look at all sides and study it. You can also use like a blue flashlight and look at this coral and make sure, you know, just kind of get, see if anything pops up that doesn't belong. Some people are very cautious and they will cut off the coral off the frag plug and throw the frag plug away. That way they know they're only putting in a healthy piece of coral in their tank. But all those things being said, what happens when they're finally in your tank? What can you do? And the first thing, of course, people think of is, is there a treatment? There's not. There's not some treatment you can just put in your tank. And there's not some fish that will just magically eat them all. I mean, that's just being uh, really optimistic and unrealistic. So that was the first picture. Let me show you another one. Um, so here is the picture getting smaller. <laughs> uh, here is a close up of the uh, Montipora polyps. Now, this is the dead area, there's no life on this Monty. This is the underside of the coral. And these, mo these, uh, Monopore eating nudibranch are right there, and they're kind of collapsed because there's no water on them. So they look like squiggles, you know, like some kind of weird thing, like a web or something. But that's not what their normal look looks like in the tank. This is after it's been removed from water. Then, um, I want you also to know what the eggs look like. So that's this next picture. So at the top of this picture, or the middle of the picture, I guess, you could say that's the parent. That's the adult Montefiore eating nudibranch. And then all those dots underneath are eggs. And every one of those is going to turn into another nudibranch that will release and eat Montefiore. And if you, oops, I don't know why the picture's not on there. Hang on. There we go. Um, so why is it? Notifications. <laughs> There we go. Um, the uh, nudibranch itself and all of its babies are always going to be on the underside of the coral. And if you look really closely at that picture, right above the nudibranch, you'll see where there's some tan tissue, but then it kind of turns into white. And that is because they have consumed the Montipora tissue to grow and thrive and make babies. And that's how they work. They plant their babies near where the life of the skin of the coral starts. So as soon as they hatch, they can start eating immediately. And that is very important because that means you know where to look for them in the first place. They're not just going to be out in plain sight on the top unless they happen to fall on a Montipora. But they are not going to be a, uh, you know, you won't see a herd of them going across the coral. So I want you to know that. Um, let's see. It's kind of hard doing this slide out of slide. I don't like this. Now, here is a coral that has quite a few of them, and this is in the tank. And you can see how 
There's some on the left. There's three of them on the left. There is one near the bottom. There's one on the right. Uh, there might be one kind of there in the V shape between the two branches. And again, where it is, where the, cor the, uh, the pest is, the coral's turned white because they've eaten the tissue right off the skeleton. Okay. And then the next one I want to show you. Let's see. I think I'm going to show you this. Okay, so this picture here is when I tried to photograph one. And that little tiny jar is on top of a normal jar, which is in front of a normal PAR-38 light bulb. So a PAR-38 light bulb is probably, I don't know, four inches in diameter. That's a jelly jar that, you know, usually a strawberry jelly. And then on top is like a little sampler jar. And the arrow is pointing to the little speck of a crumb of a Montipora eating nudibranch. And then the next picture... is from above and so you can see uh, two or three in this jar right now and you know so they were plucked <clears throat> off of the uh, the coral with some tweezers and in that picture on the far left you can see my fingerprint <laughs> again I'm trying to give you a sense of scale so you know how small they are because they definitely are identifiable when you know what you're looking for but at first you're just like I can't see anything I don't see there's nothing in my tank so I want you to know that and then here is a profile picture of them so you can kind of see I mean it looks like every other nudibranch <laughs> that we're used to this is just from the undersides being backlit. You can see all the little branches that come off their backs. That's all filled up with Montipora juice that they've consumed. And they thrive on it, and that's what makes them breed so prolifically. And it's a real, real problem if they get in your tank, honestly. So you definitely want to make sure you do not get these in your tank. Let's see if I have any more pictures. I think that was all the ones I grabbed today. Um, yeah, showed that and that and that. Okay, so now that I've talked about all that, how do we handle it? What do we do to solve the problem and eliminate them from the tank? Like I said, there's really no known chemical. At one point, uh, there was the idea that maybe potassium permanganate could be used, especially if it was at a certain strength, and you would dip the coral in it. But by the time it was strong enough to kill the adult and the babies, it killed the coral too. So that was kind of written off. The uh, other possible solutions are going to be well, I mean, really, the simplest solution is to sacrifice the infested part of the coral and just throw it away. That's my best recommendation to you. Many years ago, someone gave me a whole five-gallon bucket full of Montipora. I just left it on my front doorstep. I opened the door, and there's a bucket of Montipora. And it was filled with Montipora eating nudibranchs. And I happened to have a frag system that was completely empty. It was just, you know, acrylic and a and uh, circulation and a heater. I mean, it was that. And I went ahead and said, oh, I'll put them in there and I'll, I'll get rid of these stupid pests and I can have some Montipora in my tank. And I did my best to get rid of them and I was siphoning them out. I used airline tubing and I would just go through the tank and I'd slurp up as many as I possibly could, look for all the babies, slurped them up, and it was a never-ending battle. I absolutely could not beat them. It seemed like as soon as two touched, there was babies. I mean, it was like instant procreation. And I was just, like, stunned. I'd lift a Montipora up, like a chip of it sitting on the, the bottom of the tank. And there was two Montes, and they'd crawl away, and boom, there was eggs. It was unbelievable. And I, tr I, f I fought these things for a few weeks, and finally I was like, you know what, this is stupid. Just throw them all away. And that's what I did. It was just, it wasn't worth the trouble. It wasn't like they were special name brand Montes. They were just Montipora. And, uh, and they were pretty, but it wasn't worth the trouble. So I ended up, threw everything away, and then I cleaned the whole... T uh, let's call it the holding tank, with bleach water to make sure there was no chance of anything being left. Let it dry for a couple of days, and then set the tank up. Now, if you have a, a, an actual reef exhibit that has these in there, and they're consuming your Montipora, you're going to want to remove all the Montipora from the tank. As long as there's no Monty whatsoever, no branching, no tabling, no plating, no Montipora at all, then any that remain in your tank will starve to death and die. And that'll be it. It's sort of like how... When your tank has ick, you have to have it fishless for, uh, you know, six, eight weeks or longer to running it fallow, no fish. And by doing that, the ick cycle is broken. The remaining ick in the tank dies off because it has no fish to feed on. And then eventually you can start introducing new healthy fish and no, mo no longer have ick in your tank. It's the same thing with Montipora eating nudibranchs. You stop giving them Montipora, they can't eat, they can't live, they die. 
and then eventually you can put Montipora back in your tank again and continue. There was a guy here in my local area. He had uh, a whole bunch of uh, beautiful Montes of all kinds, and he had a whole bunch of Montipora eating nudibranch, and it was a nightmare. And he, he was so frustrated and so sad. And he, you know, he tried a lot of stuff and nothing worked. You know, turkey basters, power heads, grasses, uh, hermit crabs. You know, he threw everything he could imagine at the tank trying to solve it and was having no luck. And then uh, eventually he just said, you know what? They're going to eat what they're going to eat. And they ate whatever Monty had in the tank. And, uh, you know, I didn't hear from him for, I don't know, six or nine months. I said, how's it going with your tank? He goes, well, I don't have any Montipora anymore. And I was like, oh, I'm sorry to hear that. And then, like, two years later, I, I saw him again and said, hey, how's it going with your tank? And he says, oh, it's doing great. Let me show you a picture. And it was full of Monty. And I said, how did that happen? And he says, well, I, after a couple of years, I decided I'm going to put Montipora in my tank again. And it's growing like crazy, and I love it. So basically, he just waited until there was no trace of these darn things, and that was the solution. But if you have a Montipora, like a scrolling Capricornus that's really pretty, and you see on the underside that there is a a whole bunch of little baby eggs or something, I would just break that piece off. And if everything above it is clean and there's no sign of them, that's it. That's all you do is break off that one. I know it sucks to lose a little pit, but <laughs> it sucks way more to have a whole bunch of these guys just going through your tank, destroying your tank. So my advice is to prune any infected area completely from the tank. Just remove it entirely. Don't be stubborn. And uh, that way you'll end up having, because everything else is going to grow. And it will fill in again. And it's not the end of the world that you had to go in there and do some trimming. It's just sometimes easier to just remove them with a pest on the coral and just get it out of the tank entirely rather than trying to keep trying to sneak them out one at a time. I don't know uh, how long it takes eggs to hatch, so I can't say, oh, if you did this for 14 days. I don't know how many eggs they each lay, but I do know that they are a problem, and I've run into them myself. It, like I said, you know, I had in that system. I never had it in my main reef. I was very lucky. But uh, I do always recommend any new coral you get, you dip it to, make, to eliminate the risk of possibly introducing such a pest into your tank, especially when you're shopping um, like at frag swaps or from local hobbyists. But I mean, it can come from businesses too. I mean, it's possible. There's a lot of turnover in stores and a lot of corals are, uh, you know, being fragged and shared and, you know, things just happen in time. So that was the main topic here. See, it wasn't a super long one. I knew it wouldn't be because, you know, there's only so much you can say about these guys. But I do hope that it helped you. So let me answer some of your questions. Uh, make sure you do at Milo's Reef so I know and I can see your question and I can answer it. And uh, I had uh, the fish guy already asked a question I don't know the answer to. I'm sorry. Uh, certain things that I've never used or didn't run into that problem, I, I just can't give you advice on because I don't know. So I'm going to defer you to other people that have. But his question, I'm just going to post it here. So if you have an answer, you can let him know. He says he's uh, using Vibrant now to remove some turf algae and wants to know, will it lower nitrate or just kill algae? I don't know that it affects nitrate. I haven't heard that, but yeah, just don't know. But it is designed to get rid of algae. I've never used Vibrant, so I don't have any advice. Uh, oh, I shipped out all the coral magazines this week, and uh, including one roll of toilet paper. <laughs> that was funny. Let's see. Uh, Jamie says, I have an issue where acans and chalice corals are alive but seem to slowly wither around the edges and slowly creep inward until they die. The parameters seem fine. All the others are okay. Any suggestions? Well, um, acans and chalices, they're not even the same family. And you say parameters are fine, which means nothing is wrong with your water. Your water is amazing. Uh, actually, that's usually where the problem is. You're going to have to look at your water parameters. You're going to have to look at all your tests. And, you know, today is water test Saturday, so test your tank today. See what your numbers are. See what you need to adjust. I'm trying to think about what makes corals retract like that, you know, from the edges and peel back. And uh, some things come to mind. I mean, it could be a lack of nutrition, like they're not getting enough food. It could be something's pecking at them, like a fish nibbling at them. Um, it could be some kind of a chemical you're using to fight some kind of problem in the tank is affecting them. Um, it's possible there's too much flow and it's peeling the skin right off the coral. So, it, And some corals will sometimes bail 
from their skeleton. It's called polyp bailout, and they just the whole polyp comes off, like a, a frog spawn head comes off, or uh, an acan head pops off. These things do happen from time to time. So I don't really have any more information from you to where I can answer you specifically, but those are some of my thoughts. Your tank might be too pure, too clean, and they need more food, like using Bena Reef, which is a, a really great food that I like to use in my tank and I recommend and I sell in my shop. Uh, doesn't raise nitrate, doesn't raise uh, phosphate, and uh, it feeds all those hungry mouths. Maybe something like that a couple times a week would help these corals kind of beef up a little bit. Um, could be your lights are running too long per day. I mean, there's so many possibilities, but uh, I'm, I double check water parameters first. Um. <laughs> Nick says that Alexa said, Mark, why don't you talk with me anymore? <laughs> like, she didn't even pay attention. She doesn't even care. Uh, Gordon says, would you ship to Scotland a fancy mug or shirt? Or maybe says, yeah, I think that's what he said. Uh, I, I don't have any mugs at this time. We may have more mugs later this year. Uh, but I do have something new to show you guys. So for the last year, I think, maybe a little less, I've been giving away these coasters. And they have a picture of, you know, a Nassau tank. Why is it so washed out? There we go. So uh, I've been giving these away. Every order gets one of these in the package. <clears throat> and then... These came in this week. So these are the new ones for the new year, and it's a bunch of garden eels. They're really pretty. I think I threw away the picture. I'd rather just show you the picture than the stupid coaster because the reflection's so bad in here. So this is what is going out now with every order. And uh, I, ho I hope you guys like it. I thought it was cool. Uh, these coasters, they do hold up. I mean, <laughs> they, uh, one person posted yesterday, I got my new coaster, I'm scared to use it. <laughs> like, no, put your drink on it. It's awesome, it's coasters. Just like the kinds you see at bars you know, that cardboard material, but it doesn't, I mean, I guess if you really, really flooded it with moisture, it'd get kind of messed up, but I used the same one for a couple of months, and it got a little, little bit wrinkly, kind of leveled out again, and I still use it. So we have those, which is new, and then I have one more thing to show you guys, something that no one knows about. I haven't told anyone yet. Got to pull it up on my phone. So I'm going to share this today. Um, here we go. So I ordered these, I saw an ad on Facebook, and it said that they had all these shark stickers, and I thought they were so cool, and I said, you know what, I'm totally buying these. <laughs> so I bought all these cool shark stickers, and every order that goes out is going to get a coaster, and it's going to get a random sticker until I'm out of stickers. I ordered 100 stickers. So 100 of you are going to get a treat. And I just thought, that's kind of cool, I mean, you know, why not? So I, I did that for fun. Uh, just because I liked it, and I, you know, because I'm not a big shark guy, but I thought, why not? <laughs> It'd be kind of, right? I mean, hey, do you like that idea? Do you think it's kind of a, a fun thing? I know, you're all thinking, I have to buy something? But yeah, you just get something for free if you buy something. Uh, also, uh, I need to mention this. I haven't mentioned the last couple of streams, and I, I tend to forget this stuff. So, my website always charges a lot in shipping, and I know it. Uh, it's charging FedEx rates, and there's a rumor that all shipping rates are about to go up a lot in the next few days. I don't know how true that is, but it's a rumor. Um, but the point is, the website charges a lot uh, because it's doing FedEx ground, and that's just what FedEx says your package costs. That being said, a lot of stuff I ship, I'm able to ship with the post office because the package is actually small. Like, somebody orders something the size of this tape measure, it's not going to cost $18 to get to you. There's just no way. I can ship it for like 6 bucks from the post office, and I do a lot of trips to the post office. I mean, five days a week, I'm up there dropping off packages. So, if you buy something on the website, you should expect that you'll be getting a refund for part of the shipping, uh, unless it's like a bigger, larger, heavier item, where it literally went FedEx, and that was just how it went. But so many of you tend to order one small thing. And, uh, you know, like, I want FFTASIA. I want uh, a screen for my Nero 5 guard, uh, you know, the Nero 5 guard for my pump or they say uh, I want uh, I don't know I'm trying to think of all these little things where they're small and I can ship them for you know a few dollars and I so I've been doing that for some time now I've given out a lot of refunds because I just don't desire to hit you with a shipping fee it's bad enough Amazon gets shipping for free 
<laughs> I can't compete with a ginormous company like that. But I do my best to get these orders out. And uh, there's a few people that, you know, there's always a few people waiting on me to build stuff, and I'm trying to keep up with that as well. And uh, I do appreciate the, the support you guys give me. You know, I, every week I do a show, and then people say, oh, you know, you give me so much knowledge, I have to buy something. And I see that. Thank you very much for saying that. I do appreciate it. I've always felt like it's best to help others, and then hopefully it comes back in return. And that seems to be the case. So, guys, awesome. You know, thank you very much. And like I said, I'm not trying to rip you off on shipping. I'm doing the best I can. So. Uh, Rob's Reef says, how do I update the Reef Trace app on my iPhone? You should be able to go to your apps, you know, like the apps, uh, uh, the apps app. <laughs> I think you go to App Store and then go to updates and then you just update all your apps. And some, you might have it set up to automatically update, you know, where it just happens in the background, like mine, but others don't. They have everything locked down and you have to actually tell it and, you know, you have to enable the update. And uh, that used to be the old way of doing it. Like I said, I, I barely have to do anything. My phone is super automated. It makes life really easy. Um, RJ says, is it bad that my toadstool has a hole on it and it dropped a frag? It's looking bad. Wonder if that's normal. Well, none of that sounds good. The hole, you didn't say where the hole was. Was it on the top? And was that a spot in the middle of the toadstool where it was filled with detritus and you didn't blow it off? And so now that you've cleaned it, there's a giant gaping hole there. That's, that's bad. You never want to have anything on your coral. Uh, whether it's monopora or toadstools or uh, any other kind of plating coral, you always want to have enough flow in the tank or you have to manually go in there yourself with a turkey baster or a powerhead and kind of kick off all the detritus so that the coral's nice and clean because that's how it's supposed to be. Um, Corals can drop a piece of themselves. A leather could potentially rip a piece of itself off and like drip, you know, just uh, dangle and essentially drip off. That can happen. But your description makes me think it's the whole thing's leaning over, it's miserable, something's not right in the tank. So uh, we're right back to water parameters, flow, the amount of light you've got. Um, Alkaline and calcium are very important for leather corals because it helps it stand up. <laughs> And uh, if the uh, numbers are not quite right, you're going to want to make sure those are straightened out. But no, that didn't sound normal to me. You're welcome, Brian. Happy to do it. Let's see. Um, Hillbilly says, I've tried downloading the Mobius app multiple times and it never even opens. My phone is perfectly capable, but no success. Um, might have to talk to the people at Ecotech about that one. I downloaded, I first had like the beta test version and it wasn't working that great for me. And then when I got the Versa pump, I went to the app store and there was Mobius, you know, just like ready to download. And I downloaded it, it opened up, I detected my one dosing pump and I set it and programmed it. I actually watched Reef Dude's video of how to set it just to save myself the hassle of trying to figure it out. It was very, very helpful. So. If you're not able to do it, I mean, obviously you're going to hear what everyone always hates hearing. Turn off your phone and restart it. <laughs> Delete the app, reinstall it. You know, all the, the most basic. You're like, I know how to do that. But then we do it and then the stupid thing starts working. We're like, oh, I can't believe it was something that simple. But yeah, those are my you know recommendations. And then once you've got the thing open on your phone, you might have to sign in first, and once you've signed in, then you have to detect the gear you're looking for. And it has to be gear that's Mobius compatible now, not in the future. Like if you're trying to talk to a Radeon Gen 4 you heard will work with Mobius, I don't believe that's the case yet. Um, but if you bought a Versa pump, or you have a Gen 5 Radeon, it should work with Mobius immediately right out of the box. Let's see. Uh, Adrian says, I bought my first two Acroporas. Congratulations. Uh, one is doing great, and the other one browned out, but its polyps are still out. Will the color come back? Yeah, it can. It's possible that the coral change color from the dip you use to protect your tank, and it's going to take a few weeks to recover. Or it could be the water quality you put that coral into. Is A lot of times when corals turn brown, its nutrients are too high in the water. So it's a possibility. But as long as there's life, there's always a chance things will get better. And so I never give up on a frag until there's not one polyp left. If there's even one polyp on there, I leave it in the tank and leave it alone because it can grow new tissue. I call that SPS DNA. 
and I never give up on the DNA until it's bone white and there's nothing left, then I pull it from the tank. Hey Ronald, uh, thank you very much for watching all this time and I'd love to build that for you. I'm thinking I should just build like 10 of those and just have them ready because I know you guys love to get your orders quickly and not have to wait. I'm hoping that in the coming weeks I'm just gonna have time to work on acrylic, acrylic, acrylic and uh, just do things like that because that is my, my main income. Uh, Odile says, have you noticed not many planes are flying? Yeah, absolutely. I, there's been a lot less traffic. There's been a lot less people in stores, which I'm happy about. Here in Texas, um, they passed a, <laughs> weeks after we've already done it. The governor says, okay, you can't go out. You got to stay in your houses. I'm like, you should have said this two weeks ago. But what made me upset was hearing that they said religious organizations are exempt from this and can gather. And I'm like, that is so dumb because there are churches across the nation that have switched to uh, virtual, where you can just watch the sermon from the safety of your home, and to just go and be around a bunch of people and assume you're all going to be okay is a terrible approach. And then, you know, forget religion. There's people that just won't listen. I read uh, a thing recently about how a group of people wanted to go on spring break down in Mexico, I believe it was, and because the planes wouldn't take them, they chartered a plane, and it was like half the people on that plane coming home now tested positive for the virus. It's like, I get it. We don't want to be told what to do with our lives. We don't want to be staying in our home around the clock. I get it. But at the same time, home is where the heart is. <laughs> and you know, it's not forever. We're dealing with this for a temporary period. So we just deal with it. And then, then we go out and about. Uh, I did have to run a couple of errands. Uh, you know, like I said, I ship packages every single day. That's when I leave, and I go ship. And right next to FedEx is uh, the uh, AutoZone, and I went in there, and I noticed that they'd cordoned off the entire store. So there was only a little spot where you could first walk in, I don't know, maybe it was 20 by 20, maybe it was less. And they put a whole barricade and put blue tape on the floor. You had to stay in that area. And the, there was a bunch of employees behind the cordon that said, what do you need? And they'd go get it from the store and bring it to the front. They wore gloves, they wore masks, and you, they gave you your item, you just gave them your credit card, and they stuck it in the machine. I mean, it was l so limited contact, I was in and out of that place in like two minutes flat. And then from there, I went next door to the supermarket and got some groceries. And uh, I like to shop at Aldi, because it's not a huge store, it's a small one, there's very few people in there usually. And I wanted eggs, and their eggs rack has been empty. And, you know, a lot of us, because we're at home, we want to bake things, and, you know, we want eggs and bacon, and, you know... We need eggs. <laughs> and this one lady who was standing six feet away from me, she's like, well, when are you going to get in more eggs? And the employee standing there says, we get them in every single day, but you have to come early in the morning. Well, if you guys know me, you know there's no such thing as early in the morning <laughs> because I get up at the crack of noon like a normal person, so I'm never going to get eggs again. And so as I was walking past the glass cabinet, I noticed that they had these free-range eggs that were I don't know, farm-raised, whatever you call it. And I said, hey, lady... <laughs> She turned around and said, there's these eggs here. They cost more, but they're here. and You can get them today. And she says, no, no, I don't want those. I want to make biscuits or something. And I thought, I don't think it matters what kind of egg you use. But, you know, I wasn't going to argue with her. But you know what? I bought the eggs for $1.79, and now I have a dozen. <laughs> so I win. But it was just, I mean, okay, it's great. It's nice to buy the one for $0.68, cents, but if they're gone, if there's another option... I'm going to buy it and get the hell out of that store and get home where it's safe, and I'm going to start baking stuff. <laughs> I love cookies and brownies and cake and cupcakes and chocolate. I mean, I am the king of sweets. I've been a dessert guy my whole life. I'm trying to be better, but uh, I can't help it. Matter of fact, I, I was telling a friend of mine who's fighting cancer right now, and I said, I, I've always heard that people that have cancer can't have sugary sweets that you know they have to cut sugar from their diet because apparently sugar progresses the growth of cancer so much faster and i just told that person i said you know if i ever get cancer i'm doomed because <laughs> i love sugar i mean literally it's just like in everything and uh, i just don't see how i'd survive cancer it'd be hard to give up sugar oh my god i can't even imagine uh, let's see. Oh, I see. Reef Trace is answering some questions. Great. Hey, how are you guys doing it? Not touching your face. 
I talked to a really good friend on the on FaceTime the other uh, yesterday. <laughs> God, she would not stop touching her face. It was like, ever since you told me, I can't stop. And I was like, just keep your hand on your face at all times then. I said, you're already polluted at this point. It's too late. You're, you're done for. <laughs> but no, she was like constantly scratching and itching. I was like, oh my God, you've got it so much worse than I do. And I am really bad about constantly touching my face. You know, I'm, I've been trying, especially when I'm out. If I leave the house, I do my absolute best to not touch my face. And uh, then when I come home, I wash my hands. By the way, I saw a cool little video. I didn't share it because uh, it was kind of, it wasn't informative enough to benefit us, you know, as a people, but it showed how to wash your hands. And I thought that's kind of cool. And so the, there showed a person doing this with a bar of soap. And then another person came over and did the no, no, no. And they were wearing a pair of uh, like opaque gloves. And then they had a bowl of blue paint. And they took their fingers and they put it in the blue paint and they rubbed their hands together and then they held up their hands and you could see there was some blue on there. And then they showed the other hand, this side was completely opaque still. So then they took their hands and they rubbed between the fingers like this and then they did the opposite on this side and now you had blue paint on both sides of the gloves but there was a lot of patchy areas where there wasn't any. Then they had to do this with the fingers to get the blue paint on those fingers. Um, and then they had to go around each thumb and then they did the back of the hands and the palm of the hand, and then the wrist, until it looked like they were wearing two blue gloves. It was really neat. <laughs> and I thought, oh, that's cool. But the reason I didn't share the video is because everything afterwards was like how to concoct this or that, like how you can make your own disinfectant, how you can make your own cough drops, how you can make your own this. And it, while it showed ingredients, it never told you how much of anything. So it didn't teach you anything. And when you clicked the stupid video on Facebook, it took you to like how to buy car insurance for your car. <laughs> This is such a pointless video. I mean, come on, make it where it can help us. So, so I did not share that one. But I did, I've been washing my hands differently since seeing that video. That did help me. So hopefully it helps you too. Uh, Mike says, I'm running the Herbie system with a three quarter inch return, dr return drain. All right, let's, let's clarify things. The return is the water going up. It's returning to the tank. The drain is the thing draining to the sump. So, if I oversize the pipe on the drain, will that increase my flow? My core 20 is at 30%. I'd like to increase the flow from the pump. Your drain can only handle so much water. And that is dictated by the pipe inside your overflow box, the size of the bulkhead, and the pipe coming down into the sump. If you could increase all of those to a larger size pipe, like, let's say, I, you said three quarter. And I don't know if that's return or if that's drain. But let's just pretend your drain is three quarters of an inch. That's very, very small. And it limits very you know, significantly how much water can drain. And even if you were to turn up the flow and it could manage to handle it, it's going to become very noisy very quickly. But if your drain was one inch, one and a quarter, one and a half inch, it can handle much more flow and you could turn that pump up. So right now, if you are unable because you can't, you know, the limitation of the plumbing, the bulkheads and everything just stop you from running your pump faster, you're not going to run it faster, but at least you've got that pump you can use later with the next tank that's bigger and you know you can turn it up to a higher speed. At, at least you've got a pump that's adjustable and you can dial it down. But you're going to need your drain pipes to be larger to accommodate how much water can drain down them uh, and still drain down quietly too. Uh, Reefkeeper says, do you have any thoughts on the Radeon XR30 G5 Pro versus Blue? Yes, get the Pro. And I know why they made the blue, because a lot of people like the tank looking like this behind me all the time, which I find to be very, you know, nice temporarily, but I don't find it's the best way to grow corals. Still tell you guys use daylight. With the regular G5 Pro, you have all the lights you like, and it includes blue, but it doesn't go into this crazy deep blue that people just seem to want to buy corals under. You know, because you go to the store and everything's just glowing blue and every coral's popping and you're just like, here's my credit card, here's my cash, here's my Bitcoin, you know. <laughs> Do you take silver? You know, we, we just buy it all and we put it in our tank and then we don't see the same result. We don't, it doesn't look quite as nice because we're not running the crazy blue. But um, Reef Dudes did a comparison between the two of them on his channel. And uh, I asked, and I saw him in the comments, he says, I'm getting the Pro. And I thought that's a good choice because it allows you to have some white light, you can grow the corals, and then you got the blue light to where you can uh, get the nice coloration 
and you can enjoy the best of both worlds where you go into the blue only you're going to be limited to that general amount of uh, adjustments so that is my opinion and I haven't gotten mine yet I ordered the Gen 5 Pro XR15 and I was told it's gonna go out the end of April but then the Ecotec closed so I don't know when I'm getting it Um, Kevin Jane says, do, do you or anyone else know what is the most similar product to Vibrant? None of my local fish stores carry it. If you can't get Vibrant online, which is what a lot of people are doing these days because they don't want to go out, uh, you could use another product like Reef Flux. And I do sell that in my shop and I sell it for different size tanks. So you know, I've got the, the vial of powder for a 100 gallon tank, a 200 gallon tank, 200, yeah, 200 gallon tank and a 350 gallon tank. So you can kind of decide how, how much of that you need because it'll save you money buying a bigger one if you have a bigger, you know, whatever, you figure out the math. But uh, Reef Flux gets rid of bryopsis and green hair algae. If you use it at triple the strength, it gets rid of valonia. So there's that. And if you, you know, want Vibrant, then you're just going to have to go to an online vendor that sells it. Let's see. Um... <laughs> Trevor says, I like this, I'm going to share it. These live chats are like a godsend with the lockdown here in the UK. I'm running out of things to do around the house. Even cleaned my sump out today, but it did need it though. Yeah, no, I mean, it's great. We're getting things cleaned. I'm actually having to still force myself, you know, to do the, the regular normal cleaning, but it's just like, ugh, again? You know, I mean, forget it. Every day we have to cook and wash dishes. It sucks, right? But, uh, you know, Getting in the bathroom and cleaning the counters and the sinks and the toilets and the showers and all that is a thing. Cleaning the doorknobs on your house, mopping the floors, vacuuming, you know, it seems to never end. And we're home all day, so we're even more likely to see as things get dirty more rapidly and we have to do it. And then working on our tanks. A lot of people were joking, hey, my tank has never looked better since I've been stuck at home for 14 days. And I believe that. I think a lot of us are tackling our projects that we've been like, I don't have time, I don't have time. Suddenly, some of us have a lot of free time. And I'm a little bit jealous that you have this free time. I'm not. I'm working. So I'm not essential. I'm just working. <laughs> but I'm working here from the house. So like I always have. I've been self-employed so long, I can't even understand a going to the job. I'll tell you something you guys don't know. A long time ago, um, I was struggling to pay the bills. I had a family and I had a kid and I had to, you know, get groceries. And my, my own business wasn't making enough money. So I got a job at Home Depot. And when they hired me, they said, well, we're going to make you a lot loader. And a lot loader was a guy that just took the stuff off the cart and put it in the person's car. And I did that for, I don't know, eight or nine months, maybe longer. And I had to do it when it was freezing cold. I had to do it when it was raining. I had to do it when it was hot because of Texas. And the worst part is the store I was doing at, working at, had a huge hill where everyone parked. And they had those lumber carts. And people take the cart all the way down the hill, unload their lumber, and leave it down there for me to haul back up. So I'd have to push these carts up the hill, marching my way up with these giant heavy carts, till I finally got to level floor and roll it to the back of the building. And I did this every single day. And I kept wanting to get a job indoors. I really wanted to be a cashier because I thought, if I'm a cashier, my life will be so easy. I can just stand in one spot and go bloop, bloop, bloop. So easy. Those guys have no idea what work is like. <laughs> let them be a lot loader for a while and uh, I did it for a while but my business was picking up and I was working at night cleaning floors and when I would finish it's like I would have just enough time to get home take a shower go to work at Home Depot and I was finding that I was getting more and more I was I was showing up for work late I just couldn't do it and I finally just had to say I'm sorry guys I quit you know I just I cannot do two schedules it just won't work and the store manager really liked me, and you know, but the person that was in charge of the cashiers and the lot loader, she hated my guts. Oh, did she hate me? Oh my God, it was so bad. And uh, so the store manager gave me these cool projects to do inside when it wasn't busy, like do an entire end cap. And so I was like, oh, I loved it because I could build whatever I wanted, I could do something. And I would go to every cashier and say, hey, if you need me, all you do is page me and I'll come immediately and help that customer. And, but when that lady saw I wasn't waiting in front of the store, she would then get so mad and she wanted to write me up. You weren't where you belong. I was like, every cashier knows where I am. She hated me. She hated me. So when I went in there and said, look, I, I've got to quit. 
you know, by the time I get home from work, you know, because I had to wait for the wax to dry. Once it's dry, I had to put everything back into the store where it belonged, you know, because you can't put anything on wet wax. Once it's dry, I brought everything back in, locked the door, jumped in my vehicle, drove home, and I was showing up late. <clears throat> and I said, I can't do it. And the store manager says, okay, I understand, you know, but if, you know, you know, well, I mean, that, I'm just going to stop right there. So he said, you know, it's okay. But that lady was there who hated me. <laughs> and she said, you need to sign this first. And it was a uh, report that said not eligible for a raise and not eligible for rehire ever again at a Home Depot. And I just looked at her. I'm like, I'm not signing that. And she said, you have to. You must. And I looked at her. I was like, no, I'm not signing that. You're out of your mind. Number one, I'm quitting. Why would I sign something about not getting a raise? Because you'd never give it to me anyway. Nor did I do anything wrong. I'm coming forward and saying my schedule doesn't coincide with Home Depot's and I just have to choose one or the other. So I'm going to choose my own company. And she was just blustering and all upset. And I looked at the store manager in the eye. I said, do I have to sign this? And he's like, of course you don't. I was like, okay, thanks very much. Bye-bye. And I just walked out. And she was so mad. <laughs> I mean, be reasonable. And, you know, treat others nicely. You know, be kind. You know, that's what I tell people all the time. Boy. And I've never seen her again. It would be funny if one day she got a reef tank and she was looking for help online and she found my videos. <laughs> that would be great. Let's see. Um, okay. Reef Keeper by Faith says, I'm getting ready to dose Brightwell Phosphate E. Are there any precautions I need to take? Let me just throw this out there. Um, phosphate E is like a lot of other products on the market, like the Phosphate RX I like to use and it helps reduce phosphate in your system. So if you want to take a precaution, the f here are the steps. Number one, do you have any yellow tanks? Because it seems like most people that use lanthanum-based uh, phosphate remover end up risking their yellow tanks. That being said, I've got two yellow tanks that I've had for six years that have been through Phosphate RX, which is lanthanum-based, 50, 60 times in you know, the last six years. I probably, no, that's not that many, it's less. Um, I'd say half of that, 25, 30 times, because I use it about five times a year. Never had a problem with my yellow tanks. The solution to prevention of hurting the yellow tanks apparently seems to be by raising your alkalinity 20 minutes before you dose the product. So if you measure your alkalinity, and let's say it's nine, and you buffered it up to like 9.5, 9.8, somewhere like that, you know, and 20 minutes later, you dose your phosphate E, from Brightwell, it can't drop the, the uh, alkalinity enough to hurt the yellow tanks, which that's the one fish that seems to have the biggest problem. And I'm not saying that pertaining to phosphate E. I'm talking about that for lanthanum. I'm talking about there's been reports with Phosbuster Pro. There was reports with phosphate control. There was reports with phosphate RX. But like I said, I have yellow tanks and I've been using this stuff for over a decade and never had a fish die from trying to remove phosphates. So, number one, buffer up your alkalinity 20 minutes before you treat the tank. And then secondarily, don't use full strength. Use it at half strength. Take your time. And, like, if you need, let's say uh, phosphate E says to use, I'm just going to completely pull a random number out of the air, a quarter of a cup of the product. Let's say it says use that. Use half of that today. And then tomorrow measure your phosphates and see where you're at. And if that uh, didn't get it, I mean, if it worked, but it didn't work as much as you wanted, you can do it again in a couple of days and bring it down a little bit more. Uh, another thing that you can use in conjunction with your product would be a filter sock that's 10 microns. Um, that's what I sell. And uh, I heard that uh, Blue Life is going to come out with a 5 micron filter sock, which is even finer. Most filter socks tend to be either 100 or 200 micron. So a filter sock that's 10 is already super, super dense. And going to a five, like, wow, I guarantee you I can make that sock overflow in a matter of an hour. <laughs> but uh, for now, I sell, I've been selling the 10 microns now for about a year, year and a half. And the way it works is you put the product in your tank, the tank turns a little cloudy, and the sock catches most of it very, very quickly. And then the protein skimmer gets the last of it. So those are the precautions. Filter sock, use it to half strength, buffer your alkaline a little bit before you put it in the tank. Okay, Tam, uh, today's situation. Rich Walker says, uh, that's his whole name. Uh, is it okay to purchase a used sump and skimmer that shows some crazing? 
I have a chance for a sump with a, with a skimmer and the seller seems to be a great reef keeper. Yeah, crazing isn't a failure. It's little tiny cracks in the acrylic. That can happen from chemicals. Um, it could come from heating the acrylic. Uh, it can come from age. You can always reinforce the sump that you're looking at with some Weld On 16 on the inside. When you get the tube of Weld On, it's sort of like a small tube of toothpaste. Then you need to go somewhere that sells hobby supplies. I'd say Hobby Lobby, but I heard they have closed their doors. So <laughs> you're gonna have to go somewhere because you want to put a little tip on the end of that tube to have a very fine point. So instead of instead of a big nozzle where it's just like bloom coming out, you want it to come out at a you know pinhead size where you can make a nice tight bead of weld on 16 along the seam. You cannot, you should not use number 16 like caulk. If you use it too too much, it will not only as it cures, it will shrink by a third. It will suck in a ton of air bubbles and it can do a lot of crazing. So if you already have craze and then you add more of the stuff, you can craze it some more. So you're gonna have to, it, visually it's not gonna look great. As long as the cracks haven't permeated the entire sheet of acrylic and it just looks not so great, you could probably use it for a while. Uh, and same with the protein skimmer. I've seen crazing on collection cups before. I do, you know, like I said, some people cause crazing just by cleaning the front of their acrylic sump with like Windex. Uh, it just ruins acrylic, so you want to be careful with that. Uh, but other than that, you know, if, as long as things are holding water, yeah, you can definitely use it and save some money. Let's see, I'm looking for the next question. Um... Mikey says, adding a 7.5 gallon tank to my Nuvo 20 gallon for my mangroves. What would be the best light to use? I'm, it's currently lit with a Home Depot LED screw-in bulb and growing fine, but I want more growth. You know, uh, Home Depot sells screw-in bulbs that are grow lights, specifically for plants. And when your gr mangroves are growing, they're going to keep going taller and taller. You're going to have to take your light and move it up higher and higher, or you're going to have to add a second light, so one's at midpoint and one's above, to kind of really flood the area with light so that the plant continues to grow. I've tried to grow mangroves a couple of times, but I never really had a lot of luck. I mean, you know, I had them for, I don't know, a year or so, and they'd grow a few leaves, and then there would be no leaves, and that seemed to be the end. I just had this ugly stick in my water. But uh, the general rule of thumb <coughs> is that you need to mist the uh, plant with RO water to hit the leaves every single day to kind of rinse off the salt off the leaves and like I said move the light up as the plant gets taller and make sure the light isn't too close to the plant you know I didn't I don't think I used an LED light I think I used a PAR 38 bulb and those are a little bit warmer so it could have even been the temperature of the bulb was too hot for the leaves which is another reason to lift it up a little higher but you know if you can make adjustments or put it on some kind of a rail where you can slide it up and down, you know, kind of do the, you know how house plants all face the window? And so the trick to make them look pretty in your house is to turn them a quarter turn and, you know, every few days so that you end up having a nice round plant that's evenly distributed rather than all of it growing out one side of the pot. It's the same thing with your mangroves. You're going to kind of want to move that light around a little bit or raise it up and bring it to the sides. These will all help uh, be more beneficial. And then mangroves, you know, they need nutrients. So your tank is going to have to have some, nitrate and phosphate for them to consume. And it's a plant, so there's a chance it may even need things like iron dosing. Uh, but your tank is very small, so don't overdose anything trying to just keep these plants doing well. <coughs> I'm noticing a lot of people are commenting that Vibrant does not lower nitrates. So thank you very much guys for commenting on that. <coughs> Uh, <clears throat> Crisis Film says, I finally, see, I have to stop the stream because I'm choking on whatever in my throat. Um, <clears throat> I finally got a blonde Nassau tang last weekend. He's a little over six inches in length. We've already got him eating nori from the seaweed clip, but he won't eat meats yet. Any advice on his feeding? Um, the tang will eat what it wants to eat. So you put in nori, you put in frozen mice, you put in krill, you put in Rod's food, Larry's food pellet food, flake food, just kind of keep it mixed up and let the fish choose what it wants. And uh, 
as long as it's not getting too thin, you really don't need to worry about it too much. It's, you know, it, it'll learn what it likes the best. I've watched my NASA eat all kinds of stuff over the years. She'll chase down anything that's moving through the water. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I can hold up a, a frag plug that's got Valonia on it and she'll go eat it all off of there and kind of bite my finger a little bit too because she missed, you know, she hit me instead of the frag plug. I'm like, all right. But, you know, fortunately, never made me bleed. Uh, Sky and Sea says, I'm interested in Live Rock Enhance. What is it? How does it work? And can you ship it to Malta? What is it? It's a type of decay eating bacteria that's in a jar. And it's, it's a powder that you just put directly in the tank. You don't have to turn off anything but UV. And you just literally open the lid, you scoop out a quarter spoon, you know, per 25 gallons of water, and you just put it in the tank and let it go everywhere. Let it go in the tank, let it go through the overflow, let it go down into the sump, let it go through your skimmer, it can go through your filter socks, it can go in your reactors, it can go everywhere. It absolutely doesn't hurt anything. The water will be a little cloudy for a few hours and then it just dissipates. That was the bacteria being released into the system. And if you're doing this for three, four weeks of, uh, you know, like doing it twice a week, basically, you will notice, or three times a week, I think it's three times the first week and then twice a week thereafter, you'll actually watch your live rock get a lot cleaner looking. It's really remarkable. And uh, I like it. I want to do a video dedicated just to that one product, just a little short five-minute five video that gets to the point, because a lot of people don't want to watch a one-hour live stream about a product. <laughs> I wonder why. <laughs> so I'd like to do a, a short video on that at some point. <clears throat> Uh, Gary asks, what's the best type of food for yellow tangs? Uh, tangs are herbivorous fish, which means they're going to want vegetation. So veggie foods are going to be good. Uh, Two Little Fishies sell something called sea veggies. I sell uh, their nori in my shop if you want to buy a bulk pack. Um, nori is very commonly used with tangs and works really well. There are also <clears throat> veggie blends of frozen food you can buy that are good for tangs. And there are veggie blends of flake food and pellet food that you can offer. I have some from Cobalt in my shop. Um, and your tangs will devour it. So that would be my recommendation. Uh, Debbie has a strange situation going on here, if I'm reading it right. Oh, see, I was reading it wrong. I was like, how could it be 450? <laughs> she said she couldn't get her magnesium to come up. It's at 1320. I thought it said 450. Um, so... It takes a lot of magnesium to bring magnesium up. I mean, a lot. You would be shocked how much you need. You're going to want to go to Google and type in Reef Chemistry Calculator, and then you're going to type in your total gallons of your system, you know, your water volume, the true volume. Not that your tank's 100 gallons, but that it actually has 83 gallons of water in it, okay? That's very important. Then you're going to put in your current magnesium level, which you say is 1320, and then you're going to put in the one you want it to be, which is 1400, and then you're going to choose the product that you use to raise magnesium and you hit calculate and it will say you need 2 billion milliliters of this product and you're like what? and you're going to dose it in your tank on a regular basis and it will eventually bring that magnesium up where it needs to be and then uh, it'll stay up there for a long long time that's the nice thing about magnesium once it's up it stays up for a very long time but uh, it takes so much product to raise it up you it's it's remarkable we really always kind of double check our numbers like is that even possible how could it be this much i remember when i was doing that with my own i was using magnesium pronto i think it said i needed something like 23 teaspoons or something and i thought that can't be so i did half you know i did 11 and a half teaspoons and uh then you know i measured the next day and i was like okay it brought it up but not much so i did another seven teaspoons and then I checked the next day and it was up a little bit more. And finally I did the last seven and a half teaspoons and boom, it was at that number. I was like, wow, it was actually right. <laughs> it just sounded wrong. So sometimes it's going to take more than you expect, but there's no rush on this stuff. If your numbers are low and you're trying to bring them up, bring them up gradually. You don't have to do it overnight. That reef chemistry calculator will have a warning on there too. Like don't raise your magnesium more than 100 ppm in one day. That's good advice. And the same thing with alkalinity or calcium. If your numbers have dropped, you can bring them up gradually over a period of a few days so that because your corals have adapted. They might not be happy. They may be in decline, but they've adapted the current uh, conditions. So as you add more of a product to bring that number up, the coral has to readapt to the new number. It's not like, 
oh, alkaline is perfect, I'm going to be a happy little coral again. <laughs> That's not how it works. Uh, Sky and Sea says, do polyps share nutrients or do you have to feed every single one? I don't know what coral you're talking about. But for example, in the past with sun corals, it was generally thought that you had to feed every single polyp on the colony with a little bit of mysis. So we'd thaw mysis in a bowl of water. We had a little turkey baster or a pipette. And we'd squirt a mysis at each one. They'd close their mouth. And then, you know, we'd find the ones that didn't close their mouths. And we'd make sure everyone had a bite. And then five minutes later, we'd set a timer. It, the timer would go off. We'd go feed every little polyp again. And then, you know, five minutes later, we did it one more time. And then we could resume flow in the tank. And the coral was taken care of for a couple of days. But like an SPS coral has thousands upon thousands upon thousands of little mouths and they do have a shared network within their coral structure with the digestive tract and so some polyps are capturing while others are not some are even expelling while others are in taking in but it really depends on what coral you're talking about it was a fungia they have a single mouth and that coral is going to need to be given food to it uh, frog spawn has multiple heads and they're separate heads, so technically, yes, you would feed each one of those heads if you chose to do that. If you're broadcast feeding, all the food into the tank where it's blowing around everywhere, every single polyp is getting what they need during that one hour of food blowing around. So, and then every time your fish poop in the tank, your, your coral polyps are all grabbing a little bit of that to snack on. Everything's being used in your tank. But, yeah, I wouldn't... <laughs> I would not even remotely suggest that you should try to target feed thousands of coral mouths on an SPS coral. You know, that'd be, that'd be crazy. <laughs> um, okay, Steve, I'm going to try to answer this. Cycling my second tank with Dr. Tim's one and only using drive sand and life rock. Will using live rock enhance hinder the process? No, it shouldn't, but why don't you just finish your cycle? Get get done with using Dr. Tim's one and only, and you know let the tank just kind of stabilize for you know, whatever a month or so, a month or two, and then go in to start using Live Rock Enhance, and it will help to clean up whatever start. You know, it may help you avoid some of the ugly phase that happens a couple of months after the cycle. But I would use it at the same time. Uh, Debbie, back to your magnesium. You may need to put in more than you think. Uh, even on a daily basis. But then by testing, you'll know when you need to back off of it so you don't crank it up higher and higher and higher. You don't want to get to the point where like, well, I need 100 milliliters a day, and you just do that forever. And then one day you test your tank and it's 1,800 ppm. You don't want that to happen. That's why we test our water every Saturday to make sure we're within range or we may have to adjust it down. So like now maybe you only need to dose 90 milliliters a week or 80. You know, once, like I said, once you hit a certain threshold, it tends to stay there for a good long time, possibly even months. Aha! Matthew says, I recently had an issue with my Acans and Montes closing up. It turned out being a Valentini puffer that had been in the tank for months but decided to start tasting some corals. So you see, sometimes you guys are going to have a fish that was completely good that suddenly has a taste for corals, and starts nipping at these corals and it causes the corals to close up. So whenever you're trying to figure out why your corals aren't happy, one of my first recommendations, you know, after you've tested your water and verified everything's working right, made sure there's no stray electricity and no rusting magnets in your system, is to turn off all the lights in the room and sit down across the room from your tank where you're invisible. <laughs> think of camouflage. And just watch your fish and see what they're doing when they think you're away. Because just like a dog, you leave your house and the dog tears up your house. You walk in and the dog looks super guilty, right? But while you're there all, all night, all evening, whatever, the dog's good. But then you leave and it tears up a pillow or it rips open the back of the sofa. You know, it, it, they kind of act up. And fish, they see you and so they behave. But then when you're out of sight, they may go back to what they want to do. And uh, so you might catch a fish in the act of doing damage to your tank that you never thought was going to be the culprit. Wow, uh, so a competing com uh, conversation here about Vibrant says it lowers nitrate and phosphate. Man, I have no idea. Sorry. We'll just have to, we'll just have to go to the company that makes it and ask them. Let's see. Okay, Dustin asks a great question. I want to set up a 220-gallon tank 
on cinder blocks on a concrete floor. Are there any details I should consider? Are there any good videos online about cinder block stands supporting larger tanks? I'm sure there are videos of cinder blocks, but the one thing you need to know about cinder blocks is they absolutely must be standing up and down. So you've got the cinder block. Those things are 16 inches by 8 inches by 8 inches, and they have two round holes that go through them. You want the holes to be upright or vertical, not sideways. People that put the cinder block on their side think, oh, I got the holes, I can put things in. That is the weakest way the block could be set up. The blocks need to be standing on vertically so that the holes are up as if you're going to pour concrete down the holes. And if you do it that way, they'll be nice and strong, and they'll be able to hold the weight of your tank with no problem whatsoever. So uh, you could even run plumbing down through those holes, for example, if they just happen to land on the right spot. But I wouldn't do that, because how would you ever get to the plumbing if there was a leak later on? But, uh, yeah, that's the only thing you need to know about cinder blocks. They have to be with the holes up and down. And if you do that, you're good to go. And then on top of the cinder block, I would probably use a sheet of plywood because the plywood's a little softer than concrete, and that way your tank has a little bit of give. Uh, but, you know, you're going to have to follow the directions of the person that made the tank. If they say it needs to be on plywood and foam, then you're going to put blocks, plywood, foam, tank in that order. Let's see. Uh, Fat Man Reefer says, will a 24 by 12 by 12 tank be suitable as a quarantine tank? I'm thinking about upgrading to a Red Sea Reefer 525. Um, and then as a new reefer, your streams are invaluable. I've learned so much. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, yeah, no, a 24 by 12 by 12, that's... Is that 20 gallon long? That's a, a good size tank for quarantine for new fish that come in, and uh, yeah, they'll definitely do the job. You can also use it as a quarantine for new corals um, when you're not getting fish. And that way you can kind of observe the corals for a few days and, and then dip the corals and then get them into your tank and not risk uh, getting uh, some kind of pest in your aquarium like we were talking about earlier in the stream. But no, it's a good size. Let's see. I'm reading all the comments. Um, Jason says, my overflow box has holes for the return, but only the front half of the lock line fits through it. Should I snap on the other side and clamp the overflow box? It would be hard to take apart. I'm trying to picture in my mind what you're describing. Only the front half of the lock line fits through it. I don't know. Could you send me a picture of this to my email? You can send it to sales at milosreef.com, and I'll take a look at the photograph, and maybe I can give you some tips. That's the best I can do. I'm sorry. Uh, I also saw that, Jay. It was... Um, about a coral reef, it was really pretty. I just saw that post earlier today. If it pops back into my brain, I'll tell you. He was asking, uh, there's some kind of a show on the Disney Channel that was about coral reefs, and he was trying to remember the name of it. If one of you guys knows it, let him know. Uh, Gervond says, I can't seem to keep starfish in my tank. I love them, but they keep dying after a couple of months. What am I doing wrong? Uh, it could be acclimation problems in the first place. They're a very slow creature to acclimate to your tank. you you, you got to be gradual with that. You can't just float and dump <laughs> like you can with corals. So it's a possibility of that. It could be the tank is so clean, there's just nothing for them to eat. you got to make sure that they're getting some food from time to time, something meaty, you know, like a piece of krill would be good. Um, you didn't mention what kind of starfish you were getting too, so that would be helpful as well. Barrett says, what part of Texas are you in? I'm in Fort Worth, which is west of Dallas. And thank you for the super chat, Jervon. I appreciate that. Yes, uh, just, another re uh, just Another Nano Tank is saying there's no traffic in Los Angeles. <laughs> um, it's a new life experience for me to fly past downtown at 4 in the afternoon. Yeah, Las Vegas has no people. Los Angeles is closed down. New York is closed down. 
uh, the cities are and the freeways are empty. It's crazy. And I was joking on my Facebook saying there's some producer in Hollywood who's losing his mind because he wants to film these empty uh, scenes to be used in movies, you know, for like the apocalyptic, I can't even never say that, apocalyptic uh, scenes where they have no one there. Instead of having to Photoshop out all the people, all the tourists, they're just gone. And then one of my friends who's in, you know, the movie business replied, I guarantee you there's guys out there filming right now. <laughs> and, you know, because it makes sense. How often can you get, like, the, the uh, Las Vegas Strip with no people in it? None. Zero. The, the pictures I've been seeing on the web are crazy, you know, where there's nothing. You know, just everyone's staying safe. Smart. I'm glad we're staying safe. I, I hope more and more people do it for a little while. And then I hope we can all go back to our lives. <laughs> Odile says this being around running water makes his nose itch. <clears throat> oh, by the way, I got a second shirt um, from the same person from this uh, Coral Works. Coral Works. Anyway, this is for someone here in the group. Now, it's not me being uh, picky, but this is a medium. <laughs> so you have to fit this. And this is the back of the shirt. It's very uh, sparkly. And it says answers at work. I thought it was pretty cool. So he gave that to me to give to one of you guys. So I need a moderator to help figure out who's going to get it. Maybe, again, it's a size medium. But you'll get this free shirt. I will mail it to you this week. And uh, I hope you like it. You have to post a picture of you wearing it because I want to see it. Um, I want to see the back. <laughs> I really do. Matter of fact, um, let me uh, put this back on the screen for a second. Uh, here we go. So these are the Montepore eating nudibranchs we were talking about. And give me a second here. I felt for the second half of the show I should wear my shirt backwards. <laughs> so, just for fun. I noticed the picture in picture is still working. So anyway, sorry I'm late. <laughs> Again. Yeah, I want to do that. Wow, that thing is really glowing from the lights. That's crazy. See, I have to do this to let the yellow come through. It's a fluorescent green, like safety green. It's crazy. Uh, Mo Patel says, can you comment how accurate your trident is? Um, alkalinity is always very accurate. And uh, calcium and magnesium are pretty close. They are pretty close. There was for a while there, I didn't believe the magnesium at all. And then I bought a new magnesium test kit, and what do you know? It matched the trident. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay. But uh, regardless, uh, that was just personal perception of what was going on. You know, I, I used the calibration solutions to verify things were right. And uh, no, no I, I really do trust it. It's great. And I've been running one now for about 14 months. And, uh, you know, I have to keep up with changing reagents. And uh, other than that, no, I think it's pretty accurate, actually. The, the biggest number I care about is alkalinity. And I'm using the Trident in conjunction with my Apex controller to control my calcium reactor. And it's keeping my alkalinity exactly where I want it week after week after week. My range is around... Um, 8.7 to 9.2 on a daily basis. I mean, somewhere in there, in that window. So it's barely moving. It's not like I'm 9 this week and 11 and then 8 and then, you know, 13, you know, those kind of crazy numbers. It's always right around 9. The average is right around 9 at all times. So I really do like that. Let's see. 
Uh, here's a good question. Uh, is there any consequences for my sand bed being hard in one area? I still have plenty of soft sand. I don't touch my sand bed ever. Wherever your sand is turned hard as a rock, just pull that piece out and throw it away. Don't try to break it up. Don't try to crumble it up in the tank. Just remove it. What's happened is it's calcified, usually from some kind of an alkalinity situation. And I have discovered in the past, if I tried to break it up and still use it, the tank took us a, a turn for the south. It started getting bad. So we don't want that to happen. We want you to take good care of your tank. Just remove what's turned hard, and that's the end of it. And it's not like your sand's going to continue to keep doing this. It's just a weird incident that happened in your tank once, and you know it caused that one issue. That, I mean, that's how that's been my experience. You feel free to let me know in future streams if more of your sand bed has turned into a rock. But uh, usually, it's just some weird thing, and you just remove it, and the problem solved. Uh, okay, Mark says, can you recommend a sump and refugium size for a 150 gallon tank? I'll most likely have a tang, an anthias, a couple of wrasses, and some other fish. Uh, I would like a sump that fits under the tank that uses up most of the space in the stand. So, I would think a sump that's around 40 inches long, 16 by 16 wide, and you know, 16 tall. That would be my suggestion, 40, 16, 16. You might only have room for 40, 15, 16. Um, or you might want a little bit less, but you see you have to have enough room for the skimmer and enough room for the refugium and enough room for the return zone and then any associated reactors that you want to stick in the tank too. So if you're doing all of that, you're going to find uh, that you need the bigger sump. Now the one thing you're going to lose is going to be space for a top-off container, but uh, in that situation if you had someone custom make, like me, a very small top off container fits on the end that's taller than the sump, you could still top off your tank for like five or six days in a row before you had to refill it. So that'd be my suggestion for your tank. Let's see. Turn this off. Uh, Mike says, I have three holes for plumbing, two or three quarter, the other one in the middle is 1.5. Should I make the center hole as my drain and use three quarters as my emergency drain? Actually, what you would normally do is inch and a half for the drain and two three quarter inch returns. But if you wanted to have uh, the inch and a half drain, you could have one three quarter inch return, you could have one three quarter inch emergency drain, and you could add another return behind the tank and over the back wall and into the tank. So you'd have two returns that way, and that way you've got two of the drains in the overflow box. One's the main drain and one's your emergency drain. That is uh, what you could possibly do. Or you could use all three drains and do the Herbie method, where you've got a, a vacuum, uh, siphon, full siphon, you've got a Durso drain, and you've got the emergency drain, and then both returns come up over the back, completely independent of the overflow box. That's the other choice. You know, I know I'm wearing the shirt backwards, but uh, it actually looks right on my neck if you don't see the back. <laughs> it's funny. Let's see. Uh, Adrian says, my alkalinity has been sitting at 7 for months now and is stable at 7. I have read people talking about alkalinity should be 8.5 to 9 dKH. Should I chase the number or keep it stable at 7? The question is, how is your tank doing? I mean, it's nice that the number's always seven, that's great, but how is the livestock? If the tank is doing well at seven, then just keep doing seven. Uh, the normal range I recommend is that someone pick a spot somewhere between eight and 11. Uh, myself, I pick nine, but uh, seven can work, especially in tanks with low nutrients. Uh, Melissa says, have you ever used Fluval ClearMax Phosphate Remover? If so, any suggestions on how I should be using it? No, I've not. I don't think I've even heard of that one. I, I'll have to look it up and see what it's made of, because I don't know the answer to that. Uh, <laughs> Lamont says, my Nasso is breaking up fights in the tank with a clownfish. 
Or is that normal? That stresses him out? Or is he showing who's the boss? So, is the NASA fighting the clownfish? Or is... Are the clownfish fighting and the NASA goes and breaks up the fight between the two clowns? Because that's how I'm reading it. Like, I'm, I'm, that's how I'm interpreting it. Like, the fish is like, settle down, guys. <laughs> and I've seen that happen before. Where some little fish are squabbling and a big fish kind of comes in and is like, stop it. And yeah, that can happen. Is that what's happening? Or are you literally watching a NASA fight a clownfish? We need to know. Uh, Aaron says, is it true that shrimp can deplete iodine and other trace elements? Um, I guess if you had a lot of shrimp, you could. Shrimp use iodine to molt, and when there's a lack of iodine, they stop molting. So it's kind of like a visual indicator, hey, my iodine's too low on the tank. Uh, the general rule is iodine doesn't last long in salt water. It just doesn't. It's, uh, it, it gets broken down so quickly. So... If you just want to make it part of your routine, you could buy Lugol's Solution, Lugol, L-U-G-O-L, Lugol's Solution, and that is a concentrated iodine, and you put in one drop per 50 gallons in your tank. So if your tank is 29 gallons, it's less than a drop once a week, and uh, hopefully your, your tank is bigger, because <laughs> it's really hard to dose Lugol's in small tanks. Uh, if you put too much iodine in a tank, the fish gasp, so don't do that. Um, maybe not do that on smaller tanks. Maybe just buy iodine in a bottle that's been watered down by Kent or Continuum or one of those brands and just add that because it's safe. But uh, for bigger tanks, you know, 50 gallons, 100 gallons and bigger, one drop per 50 gallons once a week is usually all you need and you'll see your shrimp continue to molt. Heron says, are you aware of any wrasses that are better predators of Montipore eating nudibranchs? I believe the dips aren't always effective. What about, especially with the eggs? Well, that's kind of what I talked about earlier in this uh, live stream. There's really no guarantee. Even if you had the perfect wrasse that just loved them, they're not going to eat every last one. They're going to eat some, and some are going to survive, and you're going to have this constant problem in your tank. So I don't rely on wrasses to solve it. But if I had to pick a wrasse, I'd like the yellow chorus wrasse. Those are great. They're tiny when you get them. And you can put it in your tank, and it'll go pick off the little pests. It'll eat bugs, pods, whatever it can find. But it's not an absolute guarantee. It's just sort of like a helper to help you with the project. Uh, let's see, how are we doing on time? Okay. Go a little bit longer. Someone thumb down. I wish I could hug them. That's funny. It happens. Not everyone likes what I have to say. Shocking. <laughs> Let's see. Hmm. Uh, Glenn Smith says, Apex has recently released the Trident. Do you know what Apex will be designing next, which will be a big wow factor for all the reefers? Uh, whatever they're working on next is a secret. Uh, the only thing we've heard a rumor of from one article that I think was an advanced aquarist is that they're working on a light. So uh, there is a light in the in the works. Apparently there was... Uh, I've been watching the live streams that Neptune has been releasing and they mentioned that they had some really cool things they're working on but they absolutely cannot talk about because if they do, all they do is get backlash that it's not out yet or that it was rushed to market or that it's not good enough. <laughs> so they said, we learned our lesson. We're not doing that twice. So at this point, we're not telling you anything until it comes out and then we just tell you. Just like Ecotech released the Gen 5 Radeon. We didn't hear anything about it and then boom, it's available. So I think that's how it's going to be from now on. It's just not worth the headache of having people just constantly debate and and put down the companies because they're not fast enough, they charge too much, it's not what they expected, it's not the right color, it doesn't fit their stand, they don't like the shape. Oh my god, the, the comments. <laughs> it's awful. Matter of fact, I uh, recently became a moderator in the Apex Neptune group on Facebook because they wanted someone to trim the fat. And uh, I am I am sick to death of people complaining about other stuff. So, uh, I'm there to uh, rein in some more peace in another group. I'll do what I can. Um, GTA 5 says, my tank is consuming alkalinity a lot, a lot faster 
about one DKH per day and only about 10 to 20 ppm of calcium every few days, is this normal? My magnesium is very high at 1600 without dosing, only dosing amino acids. Your uh, alkalinity is dropping a little faster than you like, so you need to dose more alkalinity each day. And your calcium is going down slowly, so you can dose less of that every day. So, for example, let's say your numbers were 15 milliliters of each every day, you know, equal in pounds. And now your tank is demanding you put in 20, but you only need like 12 of calcium. That's totally okay. There's nothing wrong with that. You're gonna, that's why we test our water each week to make adjustments on our dosers to dial it in as close as possible, what's right. But then over a period of a few months, as your corals get bigger and bigger, you may have to change all those numbers up a little higher again. Also, keep in mind, it's possible when you're mixing up a new batch of solution that you might make one more concentrated than the last batch. And so you discover that your alkalinity is not keeping up because it's a little too diluted this time because you didn't quite make it like you did last time. That's a possibility. So those are a couple things to keep in mind. Uh, okay. Mikey says, my alkalinity tested 11.4 this morning, but nitrates were high. So I did a 30% water change to lower them, and now my alkalinity is 10.2 after the water change. Should I dose two part to bring up the alkalinity back up? Actually, what you should have done, it's too late now. Um, what you should have done was tested your salt water to see what the alkalinity was in the brand new water. Because that way you can make sure they're close. Like, let's say your tank was 11.4, and then you mix up a new batch and it's 8. <laughs> so you do a water change, it's going to pull your alkalinity down. And what you could have done, you found out the water in your barrel was lower alkalinity. You could buffer that with soda ash. You can put in, whatever, a teaspoon, stir it up, measure again. Now it's 11. You're like, okay, my tank's 11.4, this is 11, I'm going to do my water change. That's, how, that's the best way to approach it, and it's a really good habit to get into. I always recommend with water changes, you check your temperature, your salinity, and I always say pH, but technically we're really talking about alkalinity. As long as those three match each other, you can change as much water as you want and not really change the dynamics of your tank. But if your salt water was mixing for a long time, like mine does, and alkalinity has dropped it, you need to buffer it back up to the right amount before you do your water change. Now, you said, should I dose two part now? You can dose some alkalinity right now to your tank to bring it up. You don't dose both parts, just the one. Or you can just wait and see what the number is tomorrow and see if you see the need. Oh, thank you. Uh, the name of the show on Disney Channel that's talking about the Coral Reef is called Dolphin Reef. That's the show you're looking for. Dolphin Reef. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. L-X-X-E-R-O. How do you say that? Lexero? Let's see. Uh, Sky and Sea asked me, do you have any experience with reef mollies? Nope, I don't. And Kurt Stoger also tells us Dolphin Reef. Thanks, guys. Appreciate that. And no, not Tiger King. That's a totally different show. <laughs> uh, speaking of, someone mentioned Chasing Corals. So Chasing Corals came on Netflix a couple years ago, and I talked about the coral bleaching. Guess what's bleaching again? The Australian Reef, again, had a massive bleaching event. It's really, really sad. Super sad. Chad, thank you very much for the super chat. He said he used Fluxorex that he got from me and will never stress about Barobsis again. Yeah, isn't that nice? It's nice to just solve a problem and be done with it. Uh, Marcus, yeah, send me those pictures. I'd love to see them. You can send them to sales at milosreef.com. Uh, Sky and Sea says, does phosphate really slow down coral growth? Many reefers seem to see no difference at all. And he did the emoticon with the hands up in the air like, huh? Um, phosphate can inhibit some coral growth, yes. But uh, I've, I'm really not a... I don't really worry about phosphate. I never have. It's never been a big deal to me. I just 
handle it. <laughs> so if it gets too high, I just knock it back down again and then it's down for a while and then it works its way up because I feed my tank too well and it kind of gradually builds up and I do phosphate RX and knock it down again. But it technically can limit or inhibit coral growth. So it's something that is recommended that we keep it relatively low. The target area is really 0 0.03 ppm, which is so little, but it's still more than zero. <laughs> so you definitely want to have some, but just a little bit. And, but there's some people out there with some beautiful reef tanks that are like 0.1 and their tank is just doing great. Uh, my friend Richard Ross has a beautiful reef tank and it's full of corals and he feeds the heck out of it and his phosphates tend to be 0.1 or higher. And that's kind of the case with my tank too. My tank is full of phosphate as well, you know, until I knock it down. I got to test today and see where it's at. Uh, Reef Keeper says my 10 pound CO2 bottle for my calcium reactor is getting low with the electronic carbon doser. At what PSI do you recommend changing it? Do you find the gauge accurate? Actually, I do. I find the gauges to be very accurate. I've had the same one on my system for well over 10 years. And uh, I keep my PSI going into the calcium reactor at 6. The, the pressure of the tank, usually when you get it, it's around 1,200 when it's full, 1,000 to 1,200. And I let it go till it's empty. And when it's completely empty and no more CO2 can go into my calcium reactor, my pH rises on the calcium reactor to somewhere around 8.1. I'm like, oh, <laughs> and I change out the tanks. So I don't sit there and like change it when it's down to 200 or something like that. Uh, you could be proactive. It's nice if you have two tanks on hand so you can just swap them. And because of the crisis right now, I'm actually wanting to refill the tank on my tank, you know, the CO2 tank, and I want to refill the second one, just have it here, because who knows? if it's gonna be difficult to get CO2 gas in the coming months. I have no idea. Um, Saint Nova says, do you see there being an issue if I use the center bulkhead slot in my Eclipse L overflow to run the return flow? I think so. <laughs> I'd have to see it. Um, Usually, with these skinny, super skinny overflow boxes, we're using them as drains only. And then we just bring the return back over the back of the tank and in. So you're going to have plumbing underneath the tank, you know, draining into the sump. You have a return pump in the sump. And then you have a pipe going up behind the tank, all the way up. And then you, you 90 and 90 and 90 inside the tank itself. And you've created a return line that didn't exist. If you were choosing to drill your tank, you could actually drill a hole somewhere to the side of the overflow box and you could have a return coming right out there. So there's a couple of choices, but uh, most of us are not bringing returns back into the overflow box. I've had people that ordered a custom made overflow box for me and then they sent me a picture later and they drilled two giant holes through the overflow box and put, you know, lock line nozzles sticking out. And as soon as I saw it, I was like, oh no, why did you do that? Because what will happen when the power goes out, instead of the water line dropping to the height of the teeth and stopping, it will continue to drain all the way down to the lock line nozzle sticking into the tank and it could suck out, you know, quite a bit of water out of the tank, you know, 10% more, 15, 20% more water could potentially drain down and even overflow the sump. So I really like to have the overflow box for drains and then the return come in elsewhere. If, if you can possibly squeeze it in that way. And then Sky and CS, are high nitrate and phosphate more acceptable or even necessary with higher alkalinity? Yeah, the tanks with higher alkalinity have more nutrients and they can handle nitrate and phosphate. It, it, it works well. It's probably why I get away with what I do. You know, because my nitrates are always high, my phosphates are up and down, and I keep my alkalinity at 9. I've had my alkalinity all the way up accidentally two years in a row at 22 because I wasn't testing. And my tank didn't even skip a beat. 22 dkh i couldn't believe the test kit i measured it twice i was like wow it really is this high uh this was obviously before i got the trident but uh oh man that was so dumb it was and it was the exact same device that did it to me two years in a row too that caused it it was a bad ph controller that didn't control anything at all apparently <laughs> and it got away from me because i wasn't doing my weekly testing which is one of the reasons why i've been emphasizing how important it is that we actually make the time every week every saturday to test our water 
But people with low nutrients tend to go with a lower alkalinity. I think the main reason is that it prevents burning tips on corals. Brian, I saw your comment earlier. I just didn't uh, say anything here. But uh, no, he, uh, he's really frustrated with his tank right now, and I just told him, take your time, reset the tank, be patient, don't let it be stressful, and uh, maybe this time it'll go better, and uh, keep your hands out of it. <laughs> These are some of the things I suggested to him. Uh, Alf Afonso says, I just got a couple of live rocks, and after 30 minutes, I already see an Asterina starfish. Should I remove it or keep it? Are they good or bad? I have no problem with Asterina starfish. I like them. I think they're great. Others will say, oh, they're evil. Destroy them with fire. I don't see the need. If you see an Asterina doing damage to a coral you care about, remove the Asterina. But for the most part, they eat film. They eat mucus off the side of corals. They're on your rock work cleaning off film algae. They're on the glass eating film algae. I have hundreds, if not a thousand, in my reef behind me. And I don't remember the last time I removed one. Not in forever. Uh, DP says, I'm just going to use the first two letters, <laughs> says, what can I do about barnacles on an Acropora? Well, actually, I think they're kind of cool. I've had Acroporas come in with barnacles on them, as well as other coral species, and I just let it live. I thought it was cool to look at. It didn't really cause problems, and the coral, the Acropora will continue to grow. It'll get bigger and bigger and get away from it, and the little barnacle will live as long as it lives. I mean, it's a filter feeder. It's not something that will become prolific. You won't find thousands of barnacles in your tank one day. I've never heard of anyone getting extra barnacles from the original one. So I would just say enjoy what you got, and then when it's gone one day, it's just gone. Um, AI Gaming says, any good wrasses that do well in a bare bottom tank? You'll need a wrasse that does not sleep in the sand. Uh, there are some that actually make a cocoon and sleep in the rock work, and every day they bust out of the cocoon, and you'll see that weird, like, casing blowing around the tank, and it gets chopped up by a power head. Um, I think the Melanurus wrasse is a sand... is a uh, rock dweller. A six-line wrasse is a rock dweller. Um, but, like, the yellow chorus goes in the sand. You'll have to double-check. You know, make sure, whatever one you're looking at, make sure it does not need sand. <clears throat> Tyler says, I just took this feather calerpa out of my quarantine to place in my sump of the display tank. What should my lighting schedule be? Feather calerpa needs about nine hours of light a day, and you could run it on a reverse schedule from your display tank. So if your display tank is on all day, you could have the nine-hour period being during the night while the, uh, the tank is asleep because the feather calerpa will be doing its thing, growing and going through photosynthesis and providing oxygen to the tank as it's absorbing CO2. And as it does that, it will help maintain the pH during the late night hours. Uh, Brian says, how would you suggest cleaning the tank and plumbing, et cetera, once it's empty upon doing my tank reset? Cycle with fresh RODI for a few days and add salt and then rock and sand. Um, you're going to take everything out of the tank. I would clean the tank. And cleaning the tank is literally going outside in the backyard with, like, citric acid and a garden hose and just going to town and cleaning everything. The plumbing itself, probably nothing you have to worry about. I mean, you may even be just replacing sections of pipe. Uh, you can always use a pipe cleaner if you needed to for certain areas that you're still using, like, lock line or something. Scrub all those things down, too, with citric acid. Anything made of plastic that uh, you can clean, clean it. And then you're going to start the tank, you know, Rinse it really well to get rid of everything, and then you're going to put it back on the stand, and you're going to add sand and rock and salt water. And uh, the salt water is using RODI water. But you're not going to have to, like, wash with RODI water or anything like that. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, Aaron says, what's the job of the moderator? By definition, keeping the peace. Uh, usually it's enforcing the rules, uh, reminding people to be polite. Um, there are some people out there that literally just live to troll and just want to cause chaos and want to cause ire and want to cause irritation and conflict and arguments, and it's just unnecessary. You know, you've got a group of people 
that are talking about their aquariums and you got a few people that just want to go in there and cause chaos and we don't allow that in Club Miller's Reef and we've worked really hard to keep it a nice peaceful friendly place and we've had to remove a handful which is so little we have over 7,000 members and we had to remove like five in a year and a half of you know that's just great and there's a couple of left on their own accord they didn't like it we were too nice <laughs> <laughs> they're like, oh, this place isn't honest enough. It's like, oh, no, we're pretty honest. We really are trying to help you be successful. And we want you to feel comfortable asking a question, just like you do here in this chat. So the Apex group for a long time, or the Neptune group for a long time on Facebook has really, I mean, I've complained repeatedly to admins saying, you guys have to do something. And finally they said, hey, Mark, why don't you become a moderator? I'm like, oh. And I was thinking, do I get to go in like, uh, like, a, like a Jedi and just cut up down all the Siths? <laughs> <laughs> do I get to be Thanos and snap my fingers and get rid of all the bad? But, you know, actually, I, I haven't gone in super hardcore and just, you know, there's, you know, I've said it in the past. I just want to go in and go nuclear and just clean out all the crap and keep the good, you know. But there was a thread just a couple days ago that bothered me. And I was like, oh. and my gut said close the thread, but I didn't. I was like, they haven't quite crossed the line. Went to bed. Next day I got up. Oh my God, did they cross that line? I was like, I knew it. I should have closed the thread. That's the job of a moderator. <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, Oh, Unfiltered Reefer says, I just received my live work enhanced from you. It arrived very quickly. Thank you for your prompt shipping. I'm glad that went well. Okay, so this is a follow-up to an earlier question. Gervant had said that he whatever starfish goes in his tank don't live. So you try to blue linkia. Very hard to keep alive. Worst. It is so hard for hobbyists. Very few people successfully keep linkia long-term. They usually, and that's one of those ones I was saying has to be acclimated so slowly. The Fromia is usually pretty bulletproof. And then the red thorny knobby one, that one's kind of a predator starfish. It'll eat your snails and your cleanup crew and uh, it might even possibly get a fish that's sleeping. So I would avoid the Linkia. I would go for another Fromia. Find that. Or find some serpent starfish. Serpent, not brittle. Serpent starfish are a good choice too. But, uh, Starfish have to be acclimated very slowly. The salinity has to match, and they have to be acclimated so gradually to get them to the salinity of your tank. You might be getting from a fish store that is at a lower number. I mean, you would think it's a reef creature they're going to have in reef water, but just take the bag of water of the fish, you, of the fish, the coral, the starfish you just got, and test the salinity and see what you're getting from the store. It might be 1.021. And if your tank's 1.026, that's a big swing for a starfish. Um, yes, Brian, that's exactly my concern. He says, are you worried that when you do your large water changes that the sudden drop in nitrates will shock your corals? I recently lost many corals doing a big nitrate drop from water change. Yes, it's a matter of fact, you know, I've been talking about my nitrates for years and I've had people, you know, say, you know, what are you going to do? I said, I don't know, maybe I'll do some ginormous water changes. And uh, I was talking with uh, Sean from Fritz. I mean, they sell salt. This is what they do. And he's like, are you sure? I'm like, what do you mean? And he's like, well, you would drop your nitrates like a rock and your corals are gorgeous. Why would you do that? And I was like, yeah, that's true. <laughs> so it's one of the reasons why I've been dragging my feet on water changes on my reef behind me and I'm wanting things to happen. So I have a new picture to show you guys. I took this right before the stream. So this is what my turf scrubber looks like. I'm gonna turn this off first. Looks like today. So you can see there's a little more algae at the top. And, whoops. And we've got more stuff. Dang it. Cooperate. Uh, we got more stuff happening here at the bottom. The bottom of the box is actually getting kind of ugly. I don't really know why the bottom is doing that because the lights are on the side. But the middle of the screen is still pretty barren. There's not much happening there. So it's just going to have to work its way across. And like I said, I did not rub algae on this in the first place, which is what I was told to do was to seed the sheet first so it'll grow rapidly. So we're getting there. It's slow. I think we're about two weeks in. And uh, it's going to take a while to get all over the place. But it's happening. So that's today. 
and this thing is a drawer that just pushes right into the scrubber. I'm actually holding it up with one hand. It just slides right in. So that's where we are so far. And once that thing starts growing tons of algae, there is a good chance that my refugium plants are going to suffer. And there is a good chance my nitrates are going to start coming down. That's what I've been told. So yes, I am a little worried about it. I don't want to uh, do too much. And um, I just want to be gradual, you know? And all the rest of the chat is you guys talking to each other. <laughs> so many com comments on here. Wow. Oh, Kurt says, when you talk about starfish, you said not brittle stars. Is there a reason for that? Okay, so typically the brittle starfish that you see for sale in fish stores is a green one. And the green one is super active and it's a well-known fish eater. So we don't want to get that one. So if I say, hey, don't get a brittle starfish, it's because I'm assuming you're going to find a green one and you're going to put it in your tank and it's going to start eating your fish and get mad at me. So if you can find a black one or a brown one, those are okay. But the green one, oh my God, it's such an aggressive one. It's on my critter ID and it's not one you want. Do I have a category for starfish? Okay, so I'll show you guys the green one. Well, actually, I'll show you a couple of these. So we'll switch to this screen right here. And so here is a banded starfish, totally fine. Here's a serpent starfish, totally fine. There is a linkia that I saw in somebody's tank. Here is the brittle starfish that I was warning you about, the green one. So the green one, when you put food in the water, that thing will just run across the tank so quickly. And eventually it can, cons it can even grab a fish, like I said. It'll stand up on its tippy toes, so to speak, the fish swims under and it comes down on it like a trap. So that's why I say it's not reef safe. So I don't recommend that one. And then do we have any other starfish in here? Oh yeah, the biscuit starfish, so pretty. I think it comes from Australia and it's really cool looking and it actually it is reef safe, but we almost never see them in tanks here in the US. I'd, I'd like to get one. I think they're really, really pretty. And here's the linky I was talking about that doesn't do well. So um, I think I bought one blue linkia, one orange linkia in the past. It didn't even last six months in my tank. And uh, so I really don't recommend it to others. And some of my friends that know a lot about starfish say not to do it. Here's the pillow starfish someone mentioned in the, in the chat earlier. Isn't that cool looking? This was at the fish store. <laughs> I just took a picture there. I was like, ooh, I've never seen that kind before. And of course I was like, and, and, and he says, do not put that in a reef tank. I was like, okay. <laughs> That's what it says here at the bottom. The local fish store employee smiled and said, you do not want that in a reef tank. Enough said. So that one's pretty cool looking though. Uh, and then the red serpent starfish is another cool one. And these are, they come in a couple different looks. So some have what looks like a five-sided, oh, let me sc scroll this up. Some have like a five-sided pentagon shape and others are, it's a round disc like the one in my tank. Anything else? And then the lovely Asterina starfish. So, all right. And then of course, micro brittle starfish are totally fine. And you can have thousands and thousands and not worry about it. Uh, Perrin says, Perrin? I'm not sure how to say that. Says, what's a good ras for a Red Sea Reef or Nano? About 30 gallons. Again, I like the yellow coarse ras, or I like the four line ras, or the eight line ras, but not the six line ras, because the six line ras is kind of a pain in the butt. It's just kind of, it's a little too aggressive. So I don't recommend that one. All right. So uh, I've mentioned it a few times already in the stream. Today's water test Saturday. Please test your water. Make sure that everything in your tank is doing well. Um, if you have to make adjustments, do it. Stay home, stay safe, do curb pickup, do uh, food delivery, you know, watch out, you know, that you don't catch this stupid virus, you know. Uh, eventually, it's going to get a lot of people. And then hopefully in 14 to 18 months, there will be a uh, inoculation to protect us. 
We got some scary times ahead of us. We just got to be careful and hope for the best and hope that our economy survives and hope that we can pay our bills. I know it's going to be rough and I know that we're going to be on edge. So try to keep remembering each day. Try to be nice to others because uh, that's all we got. We got each other. And uh, we, we really don't want to cause even more conflict and more arguments and more fighting. It's bad enough we're fighting a, a virus. You know, do we need to fight each other? So, you know, take care of your tanks. Enjoy them. Uh, I've always told you guys, if you are not happy with your tank, start cleaning it. And the more you clean it, the more you get it back to its original state, the happier you'll be with it because it reminds you of what it was like on day one. And uh, that's, that's really important. So remove things that have died in your tank. Remove things that are dead and empty, like empty snail shells, broken little twigs of corals. Get it all out of your tank so it looks clean. Just like you rake your yard of all the branches and leaves and twigs, and then you're like, oh, I love my yard again. It's so pretty. Look at it. And it's the same principle. And if you're doing all that with your reef tank, you'll be able to appreciate it more. Take more pictures of it. If you can, go ahead and post them in Club Miller's Reef. We have a great group that is designed to be friendly. And I'm very adamant about that. And like I said, we, we are just not going to tolerate aggressive people. They'll just be shown the door. And it's, a, it's basically a one chance to get in and no guarantees you stay. <laughs> it's just that simple. I mean, if you're always on your best behavior in that group, you're great. Nothing bad will happen. But if you decide to have a bad day, a bad hair day, and you come in there, cause chaos, you won't be back. I'm just that strict about it because I just want one place on this planet where it's friendly. <laughs> So that's my one little spot and I made it specifically for you guys so we can interact and, and feel safe and uh, That's really what it is. So thank you very much for watching the live stream watch for a video to drop tonight that will come out and uh, During this next week. I'll be doing acrylic work Hopefully getting a little bit of rest and I want to work on editing another video and remember tomorrow's a live stream um, with the Niagara Coral show and Wednesday's a live stream with reef dudes um, on Wednesday evening, so those are two coming up that I'll be on so if you didn't get enough today, you get more in a couple of days. All right. Other than that, have a great weekend and don't get sick. Bye, guys.